Just finished recording episode number 265 with Mr. David Wolstenholme. I didn't want to screw that one up. And he's from Worcester. Wor- Wor- Worcester. He's going to laugh at this because I still can't say the word. It's funny because, you know, up here we mix that into a drink called a Caesar and everybody pronounces it differently. But he's from that place in England. Uh, really super interesting guy. He's out with ELO right now. He's in Cincinnati and uh, just finishing up, I guess, the U.S. tour for that. Uh, said he goes back home the end of October. So I guess he's got a lot of shows left on that tour. Um, some really smart stuff. We talked a lot about networking and networking, uh, you know, MA consoles and all that kind of stuff. So show networking uh, on installs or shows. And so anyways, grab on, listen to episode number 265 on Keys of Gear. Hello, and thanks for joining me today on Geezers of Gear, episode number 265. Today's podcast is brought to you by Mainlight, a national dry hire rental provider specializing in supplying the latest lighting and stage equipment technology. Their extensive rental inventory includes moving lights, trust solutions, control consoles, LEDs, and an array of weather-resistant IP65 rated fixtures, perfect for outdoor venues. Whether for theater productions, outdoor stadium events, or TV film broadcasts, Mainlight is the partner you trust with the gear you want. Committed to quality and reliability, Mainlight also provides a robust selection of used sales options to their clients. Each item is meticulously maintained, owned by Mainlight, and comes with a 60-day warranty. Providing you with confidence in your purchase. Strategically located across the U.S., their four locations include Teterboro, New Jersey, Wilmington, Delaware, Nashville, Tennessee, and Las Vegas. They combine the vast resources of a national company with the attentive, personalized service of a local provider. Discover how Mainlight can equip your next event by visiting Mainlight.com today and get a quote directly through their comprehensive online ordering platform. And today's podcast is also brought to you by Elation. Despite the immense amount of IP-rated entertainment technology on the market, there have been no IP-rated data distribution devices to provide the required infrastructure for shows and events. Obsidian Control Systems has changed all of that with the launch of Netron IP66 devices, the world's first IP66 range of Signal Distribution for Entertainment Applications. A 2023 Plaza Innovation Award winner, the Netron IP66 range blends the proven chassis and connector technology of Alation's market-leading Proteus range of weatherproof lighting fixtures with the Netron data platform. Netron IP66 devices excel at managing complex network lighting systems in wet or dusty environments and are compatible with all other manufacturers' lighting control systems. Avoid potential costs associated with equipment failure, water damage, or downtime due to subpar protection against the elements. Check out the Netron IP66 range today at obsidiancontrol.com. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the lovely Sarah, our producer, <laughs> also known as Bernie, her, her uh, last name, but also I think sort of your touring name, right? Like when you go out on tour, people don't call you Sarah anymore, do they? Yeah, it's well, tour name and mainly it was from like F1 days. So I was known yeah. as Bernie, you know, and I was the Bernie, you know, obviously the other Bernie. Well, now there's another Bernie. Yeah, well, there's actually that, a couple of Bernies, but yeah, I know everyone's copying us now. Like seriously. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it might actually be their name, you know. 
Like Bernie That's Ecclestone right. might have been there before you, perhaps. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible that he was there. When we had Duck, uh, David Duck Burns on the show, and I was like, well, I didn't know what to call you, even in the emails. I was like, <laughs> is it rude to straight away call you Duck? You know, if someone calls me Bernie up front, I'm like, who are you? <laughs> yeah, who <laughs> the hell do you think you are calling you me Duck? <laughs> you haven't earned that right. You haven't earned yeah. that, 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 that Bernie Anyway, yeah, but that's funny. That's funny. So Sarah's probably too girly of a name to be out on tour, right? Like if you're out with a bunch of guys at F1 or or on tour yeah, or whatever. That was it. Well, actually, no, it was my Sarah's girlfriend's too was like, soft. It was actually my girlfriend's that started calling me Bernie. So I was oh, actually, was it? Girl, yeah, the girlfriend started calling me Bernie, and then the boyfriends followed yeah. fo- followed on. And yeah. here, I mean, actually, one one Greek person started calling me Bernie and it just caught on for a little bit, but then it was yeah. just too difficult. So yeah. Bernie. What's Bernie? Bernie. Only... B- 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 Bernie. <laughs> Bernie. 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 What means Bernie? What means Bernie? Yeah. Especially when we do have flames going up over the other side. They're like, Bernie, yeah. what, what? what? <laughs> uh, so, You've been there like seven years now or something, right? In, oh, in Crete? Bit. 15 years. Oh, 15 years. And you still don't speak any Greek? I do speak Greek, but not uh, to the level that I should speak Greek. Let's be yeah, like you can, you can probably order dinner and, and find out where the toilet is. But yeah. beyond that, you're screwed. But I mean, so I mean, for let's say for eight of those years, I was always traveling Formula One there. and like, you know, this wasn't my base. Yeah. So officially, this has been my base for, yeah, basically seven years, eight years, eight years. This has been my base, yeah. now, my home, and I Full really time. should, I really should, should, should. Even now, I'm married. I'm married to a Greek man, and right. I mean, seriously, the mighty how Manoli. That, how does how terrible is that? Like you know that our our well our main language is Gringlish. <laughs> <laughs> His English is fairly perfect, though, right? His English is, but at some point, says like if he's tired, then he. I mean, sometimes you don't understand me, so imagine a poor yeah. Greek man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I have trouble with you That's know my girlfriend I mean. is is British. Yeah. I have trouble with her occasionally because for her, she's very stubborn and won't get rid of the English words or the British isms or whatever. And sometimes she says things to me and I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? You know, like some of the, the old sayings or whatever. And yeah. I'm like, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But you imagine and, that doesn't uh, make sense to you. Can you imagine with, with Manoli? He's really like, yeah. no, I, I don't understand. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, oh, I'm so Could sorry. Could you draw me a picture? <laughs> 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 draw this for me, please. Uh, That's but I, I keep on promising myself that I will, I, I will learn. I will, I've, I would have lessons. I'll do this, and then. But it's it easier work. said than done. I mean, even though you're immersed in that environment, it's still easier said than done. Like I've lived in South Florida for thirty years, and I've always said I really should learn Spanish, but I've never learned Spanish. You know, I probably know thirty words in Spanish, but it isn't enough to get me anywhere or to do anything. So, but sadly. You know, being English or having English English native speakers speakers, should I say, we're yeah. lazy. That's it. Yeah. You know, it's true. We, I have I've there's so many the tourism that comes through here, it's not just Greeks, it's not just you know, French, Spanish, Italians, Mexican, you name it. We have everybody come through here. And what right. does everybody speak? Yeah. English. Yeah. So like I know I'm lazy. Um but lazy in a nice way. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? And you've gotten by this long, so it's not like you have to do it. And, you yeah. know, like I know a lot of people, uh, Bruno Dodoro used to crack me up. He he was the owner of Coamar for many, many years, Coamar Lighting and in Italy. And so when the company that I was a part of, uh, first when we started doing business with Coamar, but then we eventually acquired the company. Mm. Um it was funny because I would do business with, with Bruno daily and I could tell that he understood English, but he was being stubborn and pretending that he didn't. And so he'd bring an interpreter along and 
And I started picking up some of the words that he was telling the interpreter, like bullshit him and tell him this, <laughs> you know, and things like that. And, you know, so I had to learn enough English to know that I wasn't getting screwed. And I also had to really understand, and this was when it was Lyra. I had to understand uh, numbers as it pertained to, to finance, as it pertained to money. So when he was talking about how much something would cost or, or could, it, could we get it to this price or it needs to hit this number or whatever, you know, sometimes it was, you know. That's really interesting, vent, actually. Vente due mila lira, <laughs> you know, and I, that sounds like a lot of money, you know, but lira were like 1700 to the dollar or whatever, you know. So it was like something was a million lira and you were like, oh, shit, that's way too much money. And then you go, wait, that's only oh. 10 grand or whatever it was, right? <laughs> so, um so yeah, it's it, and he was just so stubborn. He just refused to absolutely learn English and refused to acknowledge that he knew enough English to be able to communicate in English. So, really? and that's just... so great because I also I have people here that at first I'll always always I'll try and speak Greek. I mean, there's there's uh, one to Werner at the moment. I think I told you I've been helping out, and. Yeah. Everybody in the kitchen, there was one guy that I knew spoke English. And everybody else, as far as I'm concerned, nobody did. So, every, like, every day I was speaking my best Greek. Yeah. Literally, after, like, almost a month, one man, he comes around, and he's, like, starts speaking English. But not just English. I mean fluent English. And I looked at yeah. him, and I'm like, you've been <laughs> letting me speak my dodgy Greek this whole time. Yeah. And he went, I thought it was good. And I thought it was it helped you. I said it did actually because now I'm just going to speak. That's English. hilarious, though. <laughs> That's so funny. That's so funny that he did that. Yes, I did. <laughs> You've been taking the piss. Yes, I have. <laughs> and I think hilarious. it was a test to see how good a worker I, I actually had like a good a worker because at first he just saw me as like you know Maloney's wife. Eh, what can she do? And then of course yeah. you know me. I went in and I was like. Pew, pew, pew. Yeah. Bernie's here. <laughs> That's hilarious. You know, on the on the translation thing, one time my ex-wife, we were in Denmark 25 years ago probably for a Martin thing, and we were at the Aarhus Festival in Aarhus, Denmark, and we went to this beer stand, and the guy wasn't speaking a word of English, you know, beer, blah, 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 it's this much, and whatever, and she couldn't understand a word he was saying. So she just put out her hand with a bunch of Kronen in oh, it, no. like the Danish money. And it was all coins, right? And half of them had holes in them. The other half didn't have holes in them. She had no idea how much money she had in her hand, right? It could have been, you know, 30 bucks or something. So she just holds out her hand and he grabs a bunch of coins and she goes, wait a second, are you screwing me? And he goes, yes. <laughs> spoke English all the time, you know, but just wanted to complicate her life a little bit and certainly accomplished that. So I, the same. I mean, sometimes if I'm in a group of people, not all the time, just sometimes, and then, you know, I'll be speaking and they'll be like, your English is really good. Where are you from? And I'll say somewhere, <laughs> like somewhere not England, you know, from oh. French, really. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Really? And I was like, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm English. That's why I speak English. Yeah. So um, we wanted to get you on here to talk about what you did a couple of weeks ago, which is uh, something that I guess you used to do more often. But now that you've been, <clears throat> you know, locked it down in, in Crete and married and stuck doing producing for this silly podcast, Keys of Gear, <laughs> you never do this anymore. So, um so you actually went out on tour for a week. I did. So it was all very fast. I got the call probably literally it was like five days before I actually flew out. Um, mm -hmm. So obviously I was really wanted for the tour, you know, not that someone dropped out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's true. You they planned well things, in advance to get you, you out there. You have to put there. these things into perspective. They were so <laughs> like, Sarah, we've missed you with this. And I'm like, yeah. Miss me or someone's just dropped out. <laughs> and there's no That's hilarious. Right now. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's on, you hilarious. Look at the facts here. <laughs> yeah. But it's still I'm I'm glad I was on the end of one of their speed dials. Um I haven't toured 
literally since, and I hate using the word, but it's the marker before COVID. Uh, my, yeah. my, my, my last, last gig during that summer was Muse, the Muse tour and then OMD, which was a small one through Europe. Um, and you know, I thought that that was going to be, you know, what I was going to be doing for a long time. I think most yeah. people did, although I was never what I call, you know, like a regular tour. I wouldn't go from one tour straight back to back into another. Um, because I had a beautiful island to come and live in for, you know. Well, and you also weren't married yet, right? No, I wasn't married, but like I, I was never really into that, you know, like just working 365 days a year. Like I loved this island before I fell in love with my, my um, I keep on saying myself. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to do that. <laughs> no, I love you don't want to do that. I'm not, I'm yeah. not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, no, I was in love with the island, you know, before. I fell in love with Manoli. So for me, you know, I would come back to enjoy the island and do my walks, do everything, and then go back on tour. Um, yeah. Whenever the moment felt right, whatever. Um, so yeah. to be asked to go back on tour, it was only, it literally was a week. It was three days in the end. Um, one, one, day, one day, where is it? Belfast. Then we traveled to Dublin where we did work, but then we then went back up to Glasgow for two days. It was incredible to be back and to be part of it. The team, um, like Blink Who are you with? Blink 182. Um, they were all <coughs> amazing. I mean, really, from production, Pyro. I've, I met the Pyro before, like um, on Coldplay. Um, in fact, I really want to get the, those guys on the podcast. Um, and really, it was so wonderful to be back in that environment, you know, that family yeah. tour life. Um, but just coming in as an outsider, you know, I, I was just doing the dressing room. So like, I literally just, you know, sorted the dressing rooms and then that was it. I was out of there. And then obviously then at the end, and when people don't know you so much, they're, you know, well, who's that, you know, what's she doing? Who's this? Um, but it did feel nice. It felt nice sleeping on the, on the bus. Um, so yeah. I told you before, like sleeping on a tour bus, um, with a bunch of blokes. With a bunch of blokes. Well, there, there, were, there were two ladies. No, three ladies on our, on our, it was like half, half this time. So there was half, half. Oh, wow. Half female, half, half male on the tour bus. Um, but we all seemed to just literally finish, finish work and just go to bed. So yeah, that's why I wanted to say the change. Like maybe it was because of the end of the tour. I don't know. But the change I saw was everybody was so good i mean yeah really, so good you know less shenanigans more more professional ish really really yeah like i mean that because before even you know the few years that i've been out from it like i remember you know everyone like doing lines on the bus before you got to work at whatever time or yeah. drinking or mm -hmm. all, all, all in the afternoon, you know, we've had guests yeah. on the podcast saying the same things. We'd go to the pub. You know, I didn't see any of this. You know, it yeah. was all really just like professional. And even the team that, you know, like I was directly with, I said to all of them, I was like, why is nobody drinking? And like, oh, no, I don't do that anymore. No, no, no. And I was like, wow. You know, it's it's, like, that's such an interesting concept because I think that – when you take something away from people like COVID did, you know, yeah. for a couple of years. And, and I think a lot of people started really to wonder, am I ever going to be able to do this again? And yeah. I think the people who didn't care much about it and it was just a gig, they went on to do other things and they may yeah. have come back to touring because the money's better or whatever. But I think the ones who really, really take it seriously, who, who this is a lifestyle and this is something that they truly chose to do those people i think came back and said i'm going to do whatever i can to yeah. protect this and to to create longevity and to you know make sure that i'm doing the best job that i can do and it seems like they're just different now like it's but then on the flip side there was another tour in dublin at the same time and i know that they'd all gone crazy so it could have oh, just really? been that it yeah, was a good Yeah, so maybe tour. I'm full of shit. <laughs> maybe my whole uh my whole thought here is bullshit. <laughs> you know, it's just right back to the same right, right nut back house. To the same. I don't think it is. I think 
Well, I think what actually has a huge impact and I was asked, you know, my availability for another tour upcoming. And as I've told you, I'm not available um, because I love my job here in Crete. Mm -hmm. um, but literally, I looked at the schedule for the tour and I said to I said to the person asking me, I was like, that's insane. I was like, really? That's absolutely, the schedule is insane. Like, there was no room to have a, what's known as like our roadie Friday, jumping on the bus and you've got a, you lead into a day off and it's fun. Maybe you've got another day off after. Like, not that touring is about having your days off, but it is about the daytime. It's about bonding together um, and being different places around the world and around Europe. This yeah. particular tour was literally like arenas, you know, they're not, you know, it's not even small, but load in, load out, jump on the bus, load in, load out for four days straight. Then you think you've got a day off, but actually the distance from the gig, you, the fourth gig you've just loaded out of and you're now shattered. It's like a 12 hour journey to the next yeah. gig. So you're just literally going to roll in from the bus into the next gig. You're not, you haven't got a day off. That's no day off. That's yeah. that you're sat on yeah. a bus, pretty exhausted. And for me, I see too much of that now. Yeah. And, and that huh. for me, that's, that's, that's you big people. Well, that, there. I think that is just the whole money grab side of our industry. Really? Well, not our industry, but the, the rock and roll or, or music touring industry, the live music touring industry, the, it's a money grab. You know, it's like, wait, if I can do 50 shows, can I do 70? Can you, can I do We're 80? All and going to do it. And like, then the promoters at the very top of the food chain, the promoters and the artists are are just ringing this thing out to get yeah. as much as much money out of it as they possibly can. I understand that, you know, I'm a capitalist at the same time, but you know, I like how the country stars do it. I got to be honest. I love how the country stars do it. And I don't mean the fake country stars like like Taylor Swift. I mean the country stars, the real country stars. Um Typically, it's a family business. Like, they go on tour from Thursday till Sunday, and they're back at home in Nashville or wherever they live for the rest of the week. And then, boom, they're back on tour Thursday, or some of them even just Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or whatever. Um, but they're usually doing two or three shows a week. It's on the weekend. And, um, you know, it's very family. They bring their family along with them. The The crew the band everyone else goes home as well you know it's just it's a totally different way it, of doing it okay, i think again there's a fine line of you know having you know work rest with family time you know if you're going into this industry it isn't very family related you know no. it, it, it's not you know same as formula no. one now Bonkers. yeah i mean really yeah but my worry is that somewhere we we all don't know how to say no so and that goes yeah. for the artists now, if I'm at that first gig on that that run of four, amazing. I reckon I'm going to get a good, you know, I'm going I'm to get a good performance out of that. Possibly come the third one, even they're going to be tired. I mean, really, to put on a show every night for four nights and then start it all again, like, right. they must be tired. I mean, the crew, you know, we're tired. When do the mistakes start happening? Or when... When does anything, I mean, the actual, I was talking to one of the, the, the caterers and they were saying how the owner of it, he, he was saying how they want to change it, how they want to change the hours that, you know, we give people like a day off and a this and a that. And I just laughed. And I know that's horrible. I was like, that mm. will never happen. Like really yeah. it will, because even on a day, if someone said to you, okay, you can have a day off now and that, and everyone, part of your team is all working hard. You want to help them because you become that team. Mm -hmm. So yeah. anyway, there, there's many things. I know there's trying. There's room for improvement in many aspects of it, but it's how far is is our bodies going to be pushed? You know, to do to do these gigs basically. And yeah, I remember in Formula One, it was the first. Well, we had the back to back, and I believe it was coming from Barcelona to Monaco, and really they pushed everybody's limits, I mean, to the fullest. And everyone was yeah. like, 
never we're going to do this again. Like one person did just literally a high high up person literally handed his keys and he just disappeared. I, I've nobody even heard from him again. He was like, no. I'm wow. But that was That's one crazy. out of a thousand people that were working yeah. to get this gig up and you know gig yeah. put the event yeah. running. Now for me. It's now gone insane. I think there's, well, there's not only just triple headers now, there's back double back to backs with a day off it. Like, it's insane. I mean, yeah. I remember back in my day, one again, we went there not just to work, but we were there to party. Um, yeah. And I, the season ended in October and started again March, whenever you had that time testing, the testing team were around. You know, the the race team and the test team got time off with their families. Now they don't. And that was one of the reasons why I left in the end. But yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it's different. I think when you're in your 20s and 30s, it's one thing. You know, when you yes. get into your 40s and then when you get married or you have kids or any of those things, it's just less appealing. And, you know, for some people, they still put up with it because it's a lifestyle or whatever. But I think a lot of other people have just, and you know, again, COVID was a catalyst for that. COVID pushed a lot of people to say, hey, you know what? I like hanging out at home. I like getting to know my family and my kids and stuff. Um, but then why the tours? Like if they'd have been how I remember doing all, all my tours, literally, you know, stadium tours, whatever, you know, you had, you had like two of them back to back. You were strong. You knew you had a strong six day week, whatever, normal. But then you had three days off. To rest your body. Right, but but Sarah, the problem is ninety nine percent of the tours are not those big stadium tours that can get away with doing that. Yeah. Most of them have to do theater after theater after theater after nightclub after theater after nightclub yeah. because they're trying to you know get a name for themselves. They're trying to build their social media following. They're trying to get up to the arena level, and the only way to do that is to work yourself to the no, bone. I, no, I know that, but now the yeah. arena ones are becoming that way as well. Like, you know, you, there, there are no that's the money grab. Yeah, that's to me, that's just, you know, as long as you have corporations the size of Live Nation, uh, you, that's just what's going to happen. Right. I mean, they have they have shareholders. They're a public company. Uh, public companies thrive on their quarterlies and annual reports and stuff. And if you're not growing, the stock is is nose diving, you know, so you have to constantly show growth every quarter over quarter. And the only way to do that is is either to build more venues, to um, add more dates in the same venues and have these, uh, you know, um, residencies or whatever, to move arena shows into stadiums and try and sell twice as many tickets. Um, I mean, there's only so many ways to do it, but I think the easiest way is to get bands that we're doing four shows a week to do six shows a week, you know? Yeah. And, but yeah, so, I mean, I think that that is, that is sort of a, a gray cloud over our industry right now that I think is going to burn out a lot of the people that are in their, our ages, my age, you're, you're much younger, but you know, my age, uh, fifties, sixties, even some people in their seventies, like they can't do those kinds of dates anymore, or they're struggling to do it. And so we'll we've see, we'll see how that ends on- you know, on the podcast with many of your guests, but you know, it's, it's the mental health side as well. Like really, mm. I saw so many that, that for me, in fact, there was one day I called you and I was like, Marcel, I can't do this. I can't do this. <laughs> like people are going crazy on me and I'd only been there a week yeah. and I just saw it, you know? And I was like, no, take me back to my beautiful Island. Take me back to here. Take me back to you working. Dick, 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 dick. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know what? I mean, there's a lot to be said for, for having your home life and for being able to, like, I love remote work. I, you know, I've leaned into it pretty hard, obviously, with Gear Source. And yep. uh, we have people in Europe. We have people in Canada. We have people in the United States. We have people in Asia. And I love it. Like, it's cool. I see these people every day. You know, for those of you who don't know this, Sarah and I have been together uh, through both Gear Source and Gears of Gear for what, four years, three, four years now? Must yeah, three, yeah, three, four years, yeah. And we've never met. Nope. Sarah and I have <laughs> never met, and we're like best buddies almost, and, and we've never met. You know, we talk every day, but uh, we've never met. So, 
<clears throat> we've got something brewing for LDI this year. And yeah. uh, so not only will Sarah get to come over to LDI, but we'll actually get to say hello in person Yay. for once. So that'll be fun. That'll be fun. That'd be cool. She'll probably Wait, realize like, how much taller I am than her. And, I know. And she'll I was be like, say, well, you'll be like, wow, I thought you were table? short. <laughs> yeah, funny. That's usually what it is. Like, remember Daniel? Oh, yeah, when he came and he was like, so, Daniel. Daniel, there's a funny thing about Daniel. Daniel's one of the most pleasant people I've ever met in my life. Like, him and I are still friends today. We talk often. His spirit is... Like everybody else's spirit is around here. We have good days and bad days, you know. We're we're around the fifty percent range. He's up here somewhere where it's just always up. Like it's like, whoa, today's gonna be amazing, you know. That's how he wakes up every morning. And but it was funny because again, he worked for me for I don't know four or five months. Never met him, and uh, he was scheduled to come into LDI and. Karen goes, you're going to be surprised, my girlfriend. She says, you're going to be surprised. And I said, why? And she said, well, I guarantee he's short. And I said, what do you mean short? And she goes, like, I bet he's 5'5". Five, five. And I said, no way. He's a tall guy. Look at him. Like, nobody looks like that and is short. And she was exactly right. Like, he's, yeah. he's probably 5'4", five, 5'5". Five, five. I don't know what that is in whatever you guys yeah, no, measure I know in what now. Yeah, Fathoms yeah, yeah. or whatever the hell it is. <laughs> um. But, uh, but yeah, so I met him and I was, I laughed and he goes, what, my hair? And I said, no, I've seen your hair on screen. It's your height. I don't see that on screen because everybody's the same height, right? But even when he was on screen, he just looked bigger because he would sometimes be standing and he would get, yeah. like, there's no way. And I remember yeah. seeing a photo of all of you and I was like, who's that? <laughs> who's the little guy? Yeah. Who's the little guy with the funny hairdo? <clears throat> but uh, Daniel, if you're you know, listening. <laughs> the other thing about Daniel that was so hilarious when we got to LDI. So I think we both got there like Thursday night or something. Well, by Friday morning, I think we're having breakfast in, in the restaurant, in the hotel. People are coming up and going, hey, Daniel, how you doing? Hey, Daniel. Hey, Daniel. Like he'd made friggin 500 friends the night before. And it's because of his look, because he's got that like dreadlock, crazy hairdo yeah. going on and. And he's so smiley and happy and positive and out there and he'll talk to anybody about anything. And so, I mean, you know, I've been going to LDI for 30 something years and he comes into his first show and he knows more people than I do. It was crazy. Awesome. It was unbelievable. He's, he's like a, he's like a, uh, you know, a, a, a magnet for marketing your business. <laughs> like you just want to put swag on them and have them walk around the trade show <laughs> all day. You know, you're going to, you're going to get to know everyone. Not, what are you doing to me this year? <laughs> not really. You don't have that same sort of draw, you know, <laughs> like you'd have to, you'd have to put on one of those dreadlock wigs or something to get people's <laughs> attention, get I guess. Back to come, come back to this, this year. Yeah. 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 But anyways, yes. so yeah, we're working on something for LDI, and I think probably by next week we're going to start announcing it. It's it's cool, uh, yeah. you know. It's uh, something that's taken an old dinosaur like me, uh, you know, a whole bunch of months to come up with this concept, working with some other dinosaurs on it. So um, it'll be fun. It'll be fun. We're going to announce it in the next couple weeks and uh, start promoting it a little bit, and uh, yeah. It'll be cool. Well, thank you for having me on the intro. What no, thanks for talking about it. So tell me anything that you, tell me the thing you loved the most and the thing you hated the most about your lengthy one week, three show tour. I loved coming back. <laughs> Why? That's too generic. <laughs> no, I'm joking. No, what did I? Actually, the moment when I saw all the pyro going off for the last song of the very last gig, because that was that was in Glasgow, that was awesome. The feeling, seeing the crowd, that was my best, really my what best. What was their last song every show? Oh, I don't know. I, 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 you can't tell me that. I can't. I, it, was, yeah. it, was, it, was, it was noise, and, uh, but it was just awesome. The feeling, you saw everybody, and then when they walked off the stage, like, of course, for them, they had all the families there and it was just like, it was, a, it was an emotional moment. So that, that was yeah. really awesome to be That's part cool. of. What did I hate? 
the attitude of certain people. That's yeah. It. Really, really. And, and like, sadly, the, the lack of organisation, because you know me, I like to have everything, like, that That freaks me out when I'm not in control. Because I was only jumping in for three gigs, I, I didn't have yeah. my own, excuse my life, I didn't have my own shit sorted. So for yeah. me, I was working in, under somebody else's way. System. Yeah. I didn't like that. So, yeah. Yeah. But if I was there for longer, I mean, even by the so last day. So you're a control day, freak and yeah, you weren't yeah. in control. Yeah. yeah. No, that's, that's, that's the truth. So, yeah. Yeah. No, that's cool. Yeah. So do you know today's guest? I don't know. No. Oh, because he's from, uh, from Kent, England. So I yeah, thought I maybe I he was somebody home. that I you knew. Ah, um, interesting. So really I'm going to go ahead and read his bio and then we can, yeah, we, uh, we can get him on the podcast here. Fantastic. So, and I'll probably pronounce his name wrong. David Wolstenholme. I thought the same. Yes. Wolstenholme. Okay. So David Wolstenholme is a control systems specialist from Kent, England. David has gained extensive experience touring large scale musical theater and ice shows and has spent time at the National Theater of Great Britain and Cirque du Soleil. Most recently, he has toured internationally with pop and rock artists in stadiums and arenas worldwide, working with ELO. Take that. Uh-oh. Helene Fisher? Yep. And Pharrell Williams. David specializes in lighting and show data integration and control systems, including lighting and video tracking systems for events of all sizes. Along with business partners Dom Smith and Paul Johnson, David established Show Binary Limited. The company specializes in designing, consulting, and renting data control systems for live events, theater, and film. And so thank you again, Sarah, for doing this. And uh, welcome, David, to Geezes of Gear, episode number 265. Well, hello there, sir. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm fan flipping tastic. Actually, it's freezing cold. I had to turn my heat on today. I'm in the Canadian Rocky Mountains, and I don't know. It feels like snow. Oh, very good. I think it's sunny outside, but obviously, being a full time ginger man, I'm avoiding it. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, that's a good good point. Yeah. Where are you? Uh, the dazzling metropolis of Cincinnati, Ohio. Ah, lovely, lovely. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> so I'm out at the moment. Uh, I'm lighting directing for uh, for Tim Routledge on uh, Jeff Lynn's ELO. So we've ah, got nice. a couple of days off. It's a it's a yes, a lovely old man of rock and roll to you know do a few shows, couple of days off, kind of a fair. Nice. So, yeah, yeah a perfect lot schedule. Although you you end up in places that maybe you probably wouldn't want a few days off. Perhaps I don't know. They're fine. It's fine, you know. I yeah, mean, um, yeah. It's only a couple of days, and you know, we'll we'll go and we'll go and entertain ourselves. There'll be somewhere that sells both beer and chicken wings, so there'll be something uh, to do. Yeah. Well, in the United States, and certainly in the Midwest, you're going to find beer and chicken wings in many yeah. many places. Absolutely. So yeah, um, you said Jeff Lynn's ELO. So is it one of those ones like? where there's multiple fractions or factions of the band that are so kind of broken my, up by member? My understanding of it is that um, the band, yeah, sort of went various separate ways um, a number of years ago. And then yeah. as part of Jeff buying back essentially the rights to ELO and the name and all the rest of it, it is functionally under Jeff Lynn's ELO rather than just ELO. Ah, interesting. But interesting. Um, it's a whole... It, you know, as with any anything like that, you know, and because it started off as, it's you know back in back bef back when I was a, you know, twinkle in the milkman's eye, yeah, um, it started off out of sort of different people from different bands sort of coming yeah. together and a bit of a collective thing, and then that sort of continued post ELO with Traveling Wilburys and that whole super group thing, right, um, and all that. So it's yeah, it's always been a bit like that, and then um, and this is. Um, yeah, very much Jeff and the 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 late Richard Tandy was was on the first couple of tours as well, playing um, playing piano and he yeah he unfortunately passed away last year. Oh, yeah, um, um, it's always yeah, interesting um, when bands do that though because I think it confuses the hell out of the fans at times because it's like well which version do I want to go see like uh, I know Queensrÿche there's a Jeff Tate's Queensrÿche and then there's Queensrÿche. And they're yeah. both touring at the same time, you know, and it's like, well, which one do I want to go see? The one with the singer or the one with the band, you know? And yeah, the band quite. doesn't no, have the whole 
band, but they've got part of the band, and it's weird. Yeah, I think there's a little less of um, there's a little less ambiguity with this. Um, yeah, I think mostly because you know, the, the, as much as it was a sort of a collective thing, uh, Jeff very much wrote, produced, did yeah. most instrumentation on, on quite yeah. a lot of it. So it's yeah, it was kind of his sort thing. Of relatively, yeah, re- very much his thing. Um, and he still sounds pretty good. It he still still sounds pretty good. Yeah, convinces um, the audience. You know, um, getting, uh, you know, I'm sure I'm sure you're right. We say you know he's he's you know he's what 76 now. So getting oh, you know, wow, being yeah. out on the road is um, uh, tricky. Is not the right term, but like you know it, you know as with it's as tougher. with all of us as we're, as we're aging, it's maturing. Really yeah. It's harder. Um, yeah. <clears throat> uh, you know, and he is probably also the first person to say that, you know, he's always considered himself a producer first. So, yeah. so actually going out and doing those live shows is um, something that he's he, he's very comfortable, you know, out on it. You know, we're in Toronto the other night, absolute barnstorm of a gig, you know, great, yeah. great crowd. Jeff's on form, all that lovely. Um, but, you know, uh, he, it's getting getting back into that flow a bit, you know. We yeah. Did a, we did a one-off um, late last year. We did uh, this Vets Aid thing over in yeah. San Diego, and um, uh, yeah, it's that sort of that thing the night before. Oh, okay, and then suddenly, oh, okay, cool. Now we're in we're in a gig now. It's fine. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, so because he's never really been a big live performer, you know, in the same yeah. way that yeah. some of his contemporaries still are. You know, yeah, you, yeah. I look at McCartney, for example. You know, because. Jeff produced, um, you know, work for those guys, all that sort of thing. And, you know, um, yeah, he's never been out on the road in the same way. And then, uh, yeah, um, yeah you know, we it's... took a big break over COVID and we were supposed right. to come back in, so I think, 20, 2021. I think we talked about doing a tour and then we sort of moved that. So it's, yeah, it's been a little while as well. So, you know, it's, you know, like, like the yeah, best was... coming back after that was just like, yeah. what are we doing? What's going on? What's this? What yeah. does this cable do? Um, yeah. That was a tough thing with COVID, though, with a lot of these, call them older bands. Um, you know, it was like the longer this takes, the more unlikely it is that they're actually going to tour. And then if they were older, they also wanted to wait a lot longer, you know, and it, it, it was yeah. interesting. Like, uh, do you know Cosmo? Cosmo uh, Wilson? Yeah, we've met. Yeah. So Cosmo was working for <clears throat> um, Alice Cooper. Well, not. Uh, I don't think he was doing Alice Cooper, but he was doing the uh, Hollywood Vampires, um, which is Alice Cooper and Joe Perry from yeah. Aerosmith. And, yeah. But anyways, uh, he was doing that. He was doing ACDC and he was doing Aerosmith. So they were all like in their 70s, right? And it was like, you know, how long can we actually wait to, you know, where we get to a point of beyond, you know, like, hey, they can't tour anymore. They're too old or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so that was a concern for him. Like his artists were aging while he was waiting through COVID. But it's yeah. amazing to me how many of these artists are pulling it off. You know, like obviously the Stones being the biggest example of, you know, Mick is 81 now, and I saw him sprinting, you know, sprinting it, yeah. on that ramp that goes out into the audience, you know, like literally running at full pace and then running back onto the stage. And this guy's 81 years old. Like, come on now. Yeah. It's it's um, really remarkable. Think, you know, and I think it depends on the performers as well. You know, if, they, if it's the guys yeah. that have been out, that's what they've done every day of their lives for yeah. the last what six decades or something right. absolutely yeah. terrifying yeah um you know like like anything you know you retain your you retain your physical fitness by yeah by doing yeah. All that so yeah i think that's probably a bit easier but yeah someone who's um you know those artists who are sort of less on the road and all the rest of it, i think it, yeah it's, it has been more difficult um or the guys who are still partaking you know like trying to oh, pretend yeah. like they're in their 40s or whatever and you know that's not a good idea either and you know no. i think maybe steven tyler might be more of an example of that you know of someone who forgot that he's in his 70s and d- needed to do things a little differently perhaps i don't know but uh but yeah it's it's a bummer i mean i you know i just turned 60 and so for me like all my heroes are you know aging out at this point and it's a real drag it's it's really sad like you know not I know it sounds stupid to say that it's sad when you read the news in the morning and so and so died, you know, like a a big uh, rock star or a, even a movie star or whatever that I grew up with or grew up around. And uh, but that's just part of getting old, you know. All yeah, the people uh, around yeah, you are absolutely. dying, and you know, and, and friends as well, and all that sort. Of, you know. It's, oh yeah. Um, yeah, that's the worst. Yeah, um, yeah that's the worst. 
And it seems uh, like it ramped up since COVID. Like it just seems oh, like, yeah, and again, very, I'm very getting older. So. so all my friends are getting older. Yeah. So, yeah. So no, absolutely. Um, David, how did you get started in this business? What, uh, what inspired uh, this unbelievable, incredible, glamorous lifestyle that you now lead? Oh, the glamour. I get home every <laughs> night and wash it off. Um, yeah. So I, um, uh, I was not, let's describe it as particularly academically gifted yeah um i went to a grammar school in the uk which is a we have a in certain parts of the uk we still have a like a uh like a tiered education system. yeah so i went to the sort of the oh you're you're you know the the sort of the higher end one of those but i wasn't um you know i wasn't that that kid and yeah what I found myself doing, you know, very interested in like DT and like design technology and wood shop, I think you'd call it, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. And, and you know, my um, my dad was um, an electrical engineer. He worked at the power station all his life. So uh, and I got into doing little bits and pieces on like school discos and stuff and a bit of theatre tech oh. and, and in school. And then, um, and essentially I didn't get the qualifications that I would have desired to stay on at that school to do my sort of A-levels, which is, you know, we do... We do sort of up to 16 and then seven, sort of, uh, yeah, up to 16, sort of 16, 17, you then do a next level and then university after that. Um, so I didn't, I didn't get to stay for that. So I went to, I, I found a course at a local college that was doing, um, like a two year thing that was technical theatre. So I went and did, I went and did that and, um, um, hilariously my i was i was away doing something and my mum actually got a, a, a tour around with my, my good friend Rob, who was the in-house tech there and, um had a chat about it and so i thought well, i'll go and i'll go and do that that seems that seems interesting it just seemed um, regular it seemed more fun than regular school i guess right yeah yeah absolutely yeah. It, was, it was that or go and do like an apprenticeship or go and do some sort of you know doing going working with i always quite fancied doing like milling machines or you know like yeah. actual you know, yeah um manufacture but um so i ended up doing that um it went quite well sort of just took to it a bit like a duck to water um Met some cool people and then uh, applied to applied to university. So I went to I went to um, I went to Mount View. I went to an actual bona fide drama school to study lighting, which is um, uh, uh, I realised something that not a lot of people you've had on the podcast so far no, have probably no. come up that route. So well, it's yeah, it's a mix, um, like it, and it's almost split by age. Like if you're you know below fifty, there's a good chance you went to some sort of technical theatre school. If you're above fifty, you probably didn't. And like, well, it's, I mean, it's certainly really not. Yeah, it's I not mean, perfect. Not the same way. But yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, see, I did. So I did that. Um, so I did. I, I did a degree at Mount View, and and honestly, what pulled me there was um, mostly that they did a they did a two year um, degree course. Yeah. It's quite a lot of work, you know. Uh, the, the the holidays are shorter and that sort of thing, but. But at the time, it was you know that's that's a nice option because again you know I, I didn't really want to be in academia for three years more yeah, get on three with years it. longer I should say yeah and um uh and it was an interesting thing so yeah moved to North London did that did some work at local theatres while I was there um again met some uh, met some really fascinating people and um some of whom have now you know uh, for example like I worked with Terry Cook and John Coman in a little theatre in in north london where we just go and light all the amateur shows and things and mm. and, and that sort of stuff we were, and now we're all sort of one swatting around doing these ridiculous shows yeah um, so uh you know that kind of thing um i then yeah i finished there i got my first job at prg europe as it was at the time um in the greenford warehouse um basically fixing uh me and me and my uh, my flatmate who I was, I was with all the way through uni, we both got a job working in the same bay at PRG, uh. fixing broken bits of very lights. So how did that work though? You you were like, did you go to Plaza or something, and they had a job fair going um, on, or I think they had a, they did like an open day at Greenford, okay. I think for for a bunch of students. So we went in and you know we had a chat about various bits and pieces, and and um, you know we do the whole CV thing, you know. Yeah. Um, and the one thing I've been. I've always been quite lucky with is just being quite personable and chatting to people. And yeah. Um, so yeah, sort of uh, got in there and yeah. Um, great, great first gig. Like, yeah. Because coming from that whole thing of putting, 
putting your shows together on on one level and and doing all of that stuff and doing some design work and doing some programming and and being the number two carpenter on a couple of shows and that sort of stuff. Yeah. To oh, this is this is this is the gig now. This is the, yeah. Um, you know, and having the amount of people go through, you know, and especially somewhere like um, that PRG shop in London, everybody goes through it. Yeah. You know, and yeah. even if you're only ticking away at the little sort of, you know, whatever, I'm fixing VL 1000s at the back of the room all day. Yeah. You know, you you do get to pick up on who everyone is, say hi to everybody. You see how those big shows go together. You see how the little shows go together. You know, you see a variety of stuff. Um, yeah. Because you've well, there got was... everything... From there was like probably MTV awards through to the RSC going out. Like yeah, that. I was going to say there there was probably a bit of excitement involved in just seeing road cases marked with like Coldplay or you know whatever yeah. name the artist yeah, yeah, yeah. or show, and you're like whoa, and you go home to your friends or your mom or your girlfriend or whoever it is, and you say, you know, I worked on gear that was going out on Coldplay today or whatever. Uh, yeah, exactly. There's you know there's, a, there's a bit of all that, and then just you know, and my. It fed into my brain really well, like the yeah. whole just oh, this is how a VL six C comes apart. This is how you mm. put it all back together on a on, from like a biscuit tin level of there are no motors in this. There's no dichroic. There's no yeah. There's nothing. How do we fix this? Okay, cool. yeah. You know, um, just yeah, appealed to me. Really enjoyed it. Uh, and again, got really lucky with a really good group of people within that within that department that have all gone on to be, um some really excellent members of road crew and run their own companies and all sorts, which is, which uh-huh. has been um, a really nice running theme, really just sort of turning up at these venues. And, um, and then, you know, my contemporaries there have gone on to be um, these amazing talented people. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I did that for a while and then I sort of started to get a little bit of itchy feet, yeah. um, you know, and like any warehouse job, uh, the pay wasn't great. So I was yeah. like, okay, well, you know, so I, I started applying for a few bits and pieces. I got, um, I, I worked at Drury Lane in London uh, on the producers for a few months and then did some freelance bits and pieces, uh, went back to PRG to do a couple of things, um, mostly the sales department. I think that's how I first met, like, George Masek was yeah. was doing the, uh, doing the first VL3500 wash demo. Wow. Um, that's a while which is ago. quite a thing um, yeah. which ages me horribly I'm sure um, yeah well <laughs> uh, but yeah getting that hold I my beer getting that, oh, well, <laughs> I saw the yeah, VL2 demo what, no. <laughs> you know yeah. so yeah. I mean it still makes it still makes me smile every time I turn up at a job and there are still 3500 washes just there yeah. working he's going yeah, yeah great lovely yeah. all day long please yeah um, but yeah doing doing that sort of thing and then um, ended up doing um, so it's full David Copperfield bit but um, ended up doing some stuff in the West End, uh, some tech support things for very light like, on like VL one thousands or something. Because uh. I just got to know them very well as a unit, yeah. and they they rang me up. We were having some problems with some sales units. Can you pop into town? Uh, ended up working on uh, some on oh cabaret, I think. Um, so you were freelancing um, at that point, or yeah, so yeah. just sort of literally swanning and going, okay, that's the problem. We can fix yeah. that. Get a new card down, whatever. Um, and then met the production electrician. The production electrician was after touring people. So then I went and did my first theatre tour for him. I went straight from that to what was that? It was Screw to the Musical um, ah. for nowhere near enough money. And yeah. um, like six weeks in Sunderland over Christmas. And I, I doubt you've ever been to Sunderland, but um, I don't think I have. Is there a about. racetrack there? Because if there's a racetrack, I might have been there. But if there's, there's no big, racetrack, I haven't. No, been there. there's a, a big football stadium. No. And cold. Cold's <laughs> yeah. there. It's where cold comes from. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I'm from Canada, so I know uh, where cold comes yes. from. Trust me. Um, so, no, so I did a bit of that. I did, yeah, a few more theatre tours. I spent a little bit of time as sort of a cover at the, the National Theatre in London, um, in the Olivier. Uh, they, need, again, needed a moving light tech because uh, theirs was away touring something for them. Um so Let me ask see. you something though. Were you yeah. was was theater pulling you, uh, but it didn't pay well enough? So rock and roll ended up winning, oh. or um, or were you sort of split on what you wanted to do? I I, I think I'm still split on. I, I don't really know what I want to do. Yeah. Still, um, and I, <laughs> does any of us? And I'm looking at a sharp end of forty. So um, yeah, no, uh, I really enjoy the process, but it's also it's what I knew. I think yeah. Um, as much as anything else, yeah. Um, you know, and you, you be comfortable when you know something, you sort of tend to 
veer towards that, right? Well, I know a um, lot of I know a lot of technical people who who really love theater, but they sort of had to leave in order to be able to feed their family and stuff. And you know, I think that there's actors in that same role, right? Like actors yeah. go back and do theater just for the love of of acting, uh, but they do movies to to pay their bills, yeah. right? So um, yeah, I mean, I think it's um, it has changed a little bit in in. Yeah in certain ways like um certainly you know production staff on the larger shows are paid a very comparable to rate to what i'd be getting paid to be a oh, member of row crew good um, good it should be that way that entirely does depend on the show and the producer and yeah. how much you're willing to fight for it really yeah um yeah you know and uh, you know and you know the union high or so but how much you're willing to say no to as well yeah you yeah know? and then and there are some things no important to Oh, it is it's hugely important, yeah. and yeah. you know, it's most of us don't know how to do it. But I've had to really learn hard how to say yeah. no to things. Like yeah. it's because I was that guy that would just say yes to everything, and then yeah. I was tired and exhausted and not very good. Yeah. Um. So learning how to say no properly is, uh, yeah, is key. Really, isn't I it? get it. Um, I agree like, completely. Yeah. It's probably um, more. You know, again, I talk to a lot of folks that are in their 60s and 50s and whatever and and one of the common themes is you know like if i if i were to ask someone what's your advice to young kids these days they'll say say yes to everything and then figure it out like that's a really common theme and it still rings true today but i think that's maybe at the front end of your career more than it is your entire career like as you get yeah more established you have to learn to say no to a lot more things than you're saying yes to yeah, and that, and you can, you know, you can put yourself in a position where um, it's a lot easier to say no. I mean, I I uh, brought a house and have a dog and another half, and you know, uh, so I want to go and enjoy this thing. So, so, but by I got all of that by grafting really, really hard for for a number of years, and right. I put a big deposit down. But I put a big deposit down because I was either staying at a friend of mine's quite cheap or i was effectively living out the back of my car when yeah. i was um you know i was going to hotels to prep i would do a tour i would come back i would go straight into the next prep for yeah. 18 months you know um, yeah so it didn't make a lot of sense to myself pay for to spend a house money. well it does <clears> yeah um, you know but then but then now i'm in a position where i finished doing helena fisher last year and then i put enough money away to go i'm gonna have four months off it's not gonna do anything till whatever good for you Good for and you. then and then I took a couple of a couple of weeks here, and a couple of weeks there, and that ended up till June. And then it's like, okay, great, yeah, I'll do that's that's a much better. We talk about work life balance. That's a really yeah. nice work life balance. I'll graph yeah. for half for six months and then do nothing yeah. for six months. That's great. Yeah, that's um, amazing. Yeah. Um, well, when so, you yeah, do that on purpose, that. like when you're forced to do that, it's no fun typically no. because no. you're not prepared or whatever. Like COVID, you know, oh, it's two always years off time. sounds amazing, yeah. doesn't it? Unless yeah. you only have one month worth of money put aside or whatever. Yeah, very but... much so. And I, I, I was, I was very fortunate. The few years before, I was very, very busy. I had a lot of work on. Yeah. It also meant that I hit COVID, and then my the way that the UK government did their support, I missed out because essentially because I don't see much money. Yeah. All of that money was spent on retanking my basement or getting my new my office building sorted and all this sort of this. Yeah. I've got no access to any of that money. Because yeah. Yeah. Why, why would I? But um, yeah. So Brutal. yeah, it's it's um yeah, some of those problems. Um, but I think the big the big part for me the the theatre to theatre going into rock and roll thing um was I worked for Cirque du Soleil for about four and a half years all time. Okay. Um, so I got brought on originally as uh, a moving light tech because they were going in to do. They, it was at the sort of the very beginnings of when they were moving to do arena shows. Okay. So, uh, obviously, Cirque is sort of known for its big Vegas things, um, but uh, and they're and they're big tops, you know. And then they go into town. They sit there for six weeks, two months longer. Yeah. Um, and they were taking. Uh, they'd already done Sultan Bonco, and that had gone quite well. Um, and they were doing redoing Allegria, and Allegria was sort of the at the time was one of the jewels in the crown. It was one of those original Franco Jago directed yeah. pieces. Um, so adding another person to the lighter department. Um, wanted a moving light tech, wanted someone with a weekly move experience, and then 
Uh, so I sort of fitted the bill. So I did a couple of months of Big Top with them, went to Montreal, did recreation, went out on tour with them for two years, and then went to Kadam, did a very similar role. Um, but essentially that put that sort of shifted my thing from very theatre and running shows and doing that to arena touring. Like, you know, um, not quite as run and gun as it is now. You know, we're not doing five shows in a week and all that sort of thing, you know, yeah. doing go in and do it. But but knowing those systems, knowing those um people, um the vast majority of the time I spent in the US as well. So um learning how to work with union crew and, and run those guys and and all those skills that you just learn by doing and there's no there's no easy way of doing it. It's just how it's big just is a how people. big is a lighting crew on a on a circ tour? Uh, on Cirque Tour, my one was four people. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was four of us. We'd had some, some of the carpenters that swing in and run follow spot tracks. Um, and then I think at the time, I mean, this is going back about 10, 12 years now, if not more, 16 maybe. Yeah. Um, but we had, I think, eight people on, six or eight on the in and 10 on the out or something. Yeah. From, from, from local staff. Um, yeah. You know, uh, so it's not too bad. You're moving the show once a week, so there's plenty, yeah. plenty of things. And it's like you know, it's like anywhere we would we would also be be doing those sort of B and C markets. We wouldn't be doing anywhere that we can sell a big top for six weeks. We'd be doing all these little things, like you know, you know, because we'd come up and do like Kamloops and Kelowna and Victoria and that sort of stuff. It was You're speaking great. my language. Yeah, um, I mean, one beautiful. Two, um, I got to see some parts of the US and Canada that you would as a Brit, you would never have a reason to go to. Yeah. And then you spend a week there. And I think we used to joke, you know, if the town's, if it's not a great place, you don't want to be here particularly, you're only there for a week, but if it's quite nice, well, you're there for a whole week. So it's great. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, that, and that's really what shifted me. So when I got back to the UK, I did a few theater things again, because I sort of knew enough people, um, got back in with PRG and like, um, uh, Pete Marshall gave me some jobs and John Cabernet gave me, uh, I went and did, um, Oh, one of the Bee Gees. That's bad. Okay, isn't it? Uh, I did a tour of that, which is really nice, and 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 some of the Elton crew. So, um, uh, sort of did a bit of that, and then fell into uh, fell into Neg Earth uh, because of uh, a couple of factors. One being that they were they were supplying the extras for Cirque, and I sort of popped back to the Albert Hall show because it was my old show, and they needed some cover and some help so i'm like yep great i'm not very far away it's a you know a train's a lot cheaper than a flight yeah um uh and then yes yeah, so i fell in at neg earth uh through that and and terry cook giving me a recommend or well, giving julian a recommendation and um and it's all sort of gone um gone from there really is how i've ended up doing this sort of rock and roll thing and that that's so that big transition really was was going to circ <laughs> and doing that doing that change from sort of the maybe sort of the biggest way that I'd like a theater style show yeah. kind of tour yeah. into actually how rock and roll tours on a regular basis. Oh, that's, that's awesome. You know, I mean, it, again, it's sort of unconventional when you look at how most people came into our industry, but I think it's a much more realistic and reasonable way to come into the industry. Cause the other one sort of relies on a lot of luck and who, you know, and running into the right guy at the right pub, you know, and yeah. now it and is there's still a lot of that. Yeah, like, yeah, you know, um, and whereas the UK, we're quite lucky in that all the pubs are a lot closer together. Yeah, but, yeah um... that's true. Yeah, you don't have to travel as far to find a gig. Uh, but no, I mean, especially now, you know, since since the C word COVID, um, <clears throat> you know, every large lighting company, touring act, um, sound company, staging company, they're all looking for people like people right now. You know, you're the 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 most sought after piece or component of a show and especially good people you know because there's so many new people who have come into the industry now so i think that you know for for schools to have proper uh you know training or, or education to get you at least started i still don't know why it always has to go through theater i mean maybe that's a, a good direction i don't know like over here we've got full sail in the united states and it's not completely reliable, but it's a decent school. Uh, you know, it's a private school, so it's more expensive, and and they've got their own agenda or whatever. But um, that's been a pretty good training ground for for quality lighting and sound people. 
But, you know, I still wish there were... Like, this is still viewed as a band of gypsies. You know, it's... Oh, it's yeah, hugely. Still and, and, not a and real the, career. I think there's a real lack of understanding, <clears throat> maybe, about the... About the, where, where we now have to exist. Yeah. Like, so my... So my... If I'm not here doing direction, if I'm not... If I'm not essentially, if I'm not operating a show, my main... Uh, my main skill set is actually doing um, like lighting control systems, so yeah. some networking and um, data and you know, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, and that's not something that you can sort of really quantify. Like when people go roadie, they'll go, "Oh, okay, yeah, that's that's the image I've got," and not, "Oh no, this is really specifically what I do." Yeah. This this really really tiny subset, or if you look at I don't know, like Dave Evans, like automation technician. He considers an automation mechanic. He doesn't really like operating, but he is exceptional at making everything work. And yeah. or if you look at like the the PA systems guys, again, we've all got very very specialist, incredibly, uh, incredibly sort of technical knowledge and a workspace that yeah. we're, we're now in that is a lot more um, a lot more so than maybe it used to be. Yeah, you know, you know. Oh, I'm a I'm a lampy on a rock and roll to great, but actually, well, I do, I do, I make the tiny wires do the tiny wire business, and you know, like my dimmer tech on this kiss, kiss does kiss does heavy mains all day long. And he's yeah, one of the best in the world at it. Yeah, um, and that's what he does. And he knows he knows enough about the bits I do, <clears throat> and and vice versa. But like the the the, the specialisms and the skill set and the knowledge required for some of these jobs now is so. Specific. I mean, even even operating on programming. You know, I'll, I'll be the first person to say I'm not, I'm not the best programmer in the world by by any stretch. Um, you know, uh, but those guys have to know such a specific thing. Why they 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 shouldn't have to worry about any of the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. I think we've come from a very broad church, and actually now everything is it's a lot more compartmentalized. Um, well, the size and, of these and shows I think it's a, too. And I think it's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And what we're trying to do with them. Yeah, I mean, you know, I remember a day not that long ago when when there weren't video directors out on tour, you know, it was just kind of part of what the lighting director did. You know, he yeah. he cued video things. And, you know, now they're so complex. I mean, video is such a big part of the show. Yeah. And there's all kinds of specialized things there, talent, skills, whatever. And uh and then video techs as well. You know, you can't just get the lighting guys to take care of the video stuff because it's entirely different. And even from a lighting standpoint, like it's so different. You know, you probably don't have to drop lights as often as you did when you first started, uh, especially VL 3000s, 3500s, you know, any name the brand. Like if it had oh, a, a yeah. 1200 watt lamp in it, chances are it was wreaking havoc inside that fixture. And things were not working on a daily basis. Yeah, so yeah, that's that's entirely fair. Yeah, no, we're not yeah. we're not swapping out anywhere near as many. Um, I would also present to you though that the second that lights on the floor, you're struggling to fix it because everything inside it, you know, the 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 technology we've now put into these tiny packages yeah. is so much more detailed, and because we don't have because we sort of lost it because you sort of lose it in a number of years, like a very short number of years that that fault finding moving light knowledge that you sort of is you're kind of first, if you've worked on the, if you've worked on the bench in the warehouse for a long time and then you go out on the road, you sort of start, okay, tech or maybe moving light tech, if you've worked in the moving light department, but that, that knowledge disappears really quickly when you can't yeah. fix those lights on the road. Yeah. You know, as much as, That's um, a good as point. much as some of those older fixtures, yeah, the three Ks, the two Ks, the six Cs, the fives. Yeah. That that sort of mainstay of of rock and roll touring for a long time, as much as yeah, you had to fix them a lot, but you could also fix them. They you know, it's send not you the bits, and it, would, it's funny, and but it's similar to and similar would, to cars yeah. and and a lot of other things. You know, televisions. You know, like I mean, yeah. when something used to go wrong with an electrical component, whatever it was, you could fix it. Nowadays, it's like forget it. Like you either replace it or send it back to the company or something. It's all this, yeah. you know, real heavy duty electronic kind of stuff now as opposed to just swapping out a component yeah um, um and we, i agree and with you you know and i think in a lot of ways rattling 
rattling through products at the yeah. pace that we seem to be as well. You know, and yeah. again, again, there's a so it didn't need to turn into the Dave loves a VL3 for 3500 uh. wash podcast, but um, uh, but if you took a fixture, you took any, take any modern fixture, like any top of the line brand new thing, and you said to somebody, okay, cool, I am still going to be using whatever led engine thing i'm still going to be using that in 16 years time on a mid to top level show yeah you're not going to chances that's are not, you're not, going not to telling the truth yeah, <laughs> yeah. um and I, I think some companies are doing some really good work in that space um yeah uh and in terms of reliability and stuff i think the new um you seen that upgrade thing they're doing on the 2600s or the variants yeah. yeah um i think that's very cool. brilliant like, yeah. it's really good and it's actually reclaiming all the parts and the rest of it. I think that's great. I think uh, Roby have got um, uh, some stuff going on where you can replace the engines and all that sort of thing. Um, there, there so is to, some... The longevity of that stuff is, is going to be Yeah, there's some but... marketing to that, by the way. Like but that, of course there's some Roby, to that. Roby have done it as a really slick package. It's very yeah. expensive. But with virtually every LED moving light, you can replace the engine. Uh, um, it's every just single in many light cases anyone's ever won't. made, you can replace the engine because I yeah. still am in possession of a screwdriver and the ability to correct. use it. Yeah, correct. Um, so just the fact that it doesn't pop out as a really slick module, yeah. uh, you know, like they're trying to make that sort of the marketing of it all and make it seem like it's a it's, really cool yeah. thing. We're the only ones who do this. But and ask any moving light tech or yeah. or manufacturer, yeah, and they'll say, I mean, you can ask, change our ask lamps. Any, ask any large lighting hire company who's been asked to change um, which engine is in the back of an Ayrton fixture? It's the same. Thing. Yeah. Oh, we need well, the high CRI ones on this. Okay, great. Well, we'll, we'll yeah, we'll just get the guys. To and do by it. the way, it's... how often are you changing those? <laughs> like not very yeah. often. No. Not very uh, often. So no. You quite. know, and and plus, by the time most of these LED engines will wear out, most I say, because there's some that have worn out way prematurely. But mm. by the time most of these will wear out. There's a way newer fixture that you're probably pretty focused on, and that well, this is it. That know. light's going to be gone. And then what we've got is a big pile of landfill. Yeah, correct. Which is yeah. a shame. Um, well, but, but yeah. I mean, what are people doing with Martin Pals or Mac 2000s or like we have? Oh, uh, I mean, I own. Hopefully, I own a... hopefully the Mac 2000s. I mean, they generally will set themselves on fire, but hopefully they're burning them because <laughs> if they just throw them away, there's every possibility someone will find them again. Yeah, and none of us want that. I um, I uh I own Gear Source and uh we have a listing that I saw a couple days ago popped in. I believe it was Mac 2000 <clears throat> Wash XBs. And um they're like I think two in a road case was $145 and they had like 100 of them or something. But you know <laughs> I mean, to someone somewhere, maybe that's got value, and maybe they'll yeah. go, "Oh my God, I could buy twenty of these for freaking, you know, twelve hundred bucks or whatever." Yeah. Um, and then pay the shipping. It's going to be about and, what, yeah. Double you pay that. the shipping and, is yeah. going to be more than the lights, probably. <laughs> and then you know, the first time you need to replace a board, that's going to be the price of all twenty that you just bought. And so, yeah, I mean, it's yeah. Or, I don't know. or it's disposable, or it's or it's yeah, or it just goes. Oh, okay. Well, that one's done, and it goes into yeah. The, into the big skip out the back and i think the only reason that didn't happen to some of the verilites is because prg bought the company and so they looked at the vl5 and went hmm, this thing is so super popular or it was and now it's kind of finally seeing its end let's put leds in them you know i am i am yet to see one in real life and i'm, I'm oh really a I've bit, seen i'm them. a little bit excited about it yeah yeah um, I've cause seen because I, I i still think it's a great light that vl5 yeah of it's course it is light, it's yeah. it's you know, it terrifies I'm, me the amount of money every single one of those units must have made over the years. Oh, insane, like, insane yeah. amounts of money. You know, I've had designers on here who, who, you know, from the earliest days on, like we're using thousands of those things on like the Grammy Awards or the Academy Awards or, you know, the Olympics or whatever. And it was just like every show. Okay. You know, the foundation of our lighting package is a thousand VL5s. And then on top of that, we want all this other eye candy stuff, right? I mean, it's, it's just crazy. Yeah. And, you know, like one designer told me that he said, I did the math once and I was responsible for, I can't remember the number, but it was something like $50 million in VL5 rentals alone. 
yeah. you know, just some insane uh, number. Rentals, and I was like, rentals, what? not even buying them. Rentals. rentals. Yeah. Like, 50 yeah. million um, in VL5 rentals. Yeah. Yes. Insane. I them. Although I did, I did turn up to a venue in Spain the about oh, six weeks ago. And uh, the back truss had half a dozen Mac 2000 Wash XPs on it. Oh, really? And I just laughed. <laughs> Well, do me a favor and ask them if they want another hundred. Yeah, we'll do. Yeah, <laughs> they can have yeah. a real light show there. I don't know I if, laugh the, because if I the laugh ceiling will sit there carry it. and just go right. I used to know this. How do you turn the lamp on? Ah, uh, that's funny. That's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. so yep. funny. So, you know, you started uh, you started this control company, Show Binary, which I yeah. think is a cool name. And Thanks. you started it, I think, with a few partners. And yeah, um, so, um, so tell me, tell me about the need that created you to to start that company, and when um, it happened, and all that stuff. There's a number of things. So um, one of them was uh, the the hilarious conversation occasionally at various places that Dave, can we just clone you and another one of you? Okay, yeah, right. right. Um, and I think the just doing all that stuff properly is is not tricky. I don't think that's fair. Um, but everybody's got a slightly different opinion on how to do it. And and I think it's a part of the market and a part of the industry that um, there's a lot of people are still a bit scared of what Ethercon cable does. Yeah. You know, you sort of know we are the bit five pin. It comes out the back of the desk. It goes into that light. Light wangs around. Everyone's happy. Going... Ethernet and and doing all that networking stuff is um, is still something that I think a, a number of people are um, uh, not confident with. Maybe yeah, they're a little uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so what we've we've been trying to do is basically go okay, we're we're going to start a networking company and we're going to look after um, tiny wires based projects. Um, so we sort of we started off. Um, we were doing a few things with uh, an LD out of the UK called Phil Supple. So we look after a thing called um, uh, oh, what's it called now? Lensley Lighting. But basically, you know, these big Christmas trails. You know, okay. the, the sort yep. of the Harry Potter esque things. But yeah, yeah. We, we started off with one of those, and we uh, went down the first year and and in sorts of bits out. And the next year, we went right. We're going to network this whole thing. We're going to put a network across the entire site. So we go, um, and we're on our fifth year of it now, and and we do a kilometre and a half fibre optic cable around the site, armoured fibre optic cable because they've got deer and wallabies that chew on the cable. Because of course they do. Yeah, I, why not? Yeah. Um, but it means that we can suddenly start going. Well, we can wander around with tablets and log into the MA on PC and tech everything, and everything's connected and controlled from one place rather than it all being these little sheds with an ma in or a shed with a you know or a shed with a playback device of some, yeah. some kind yeah and then well, you know then we can then we sort of going well we can do three we we did like one time coded show we could do three now because we can run qlab from there and spit it all out over dante and we can pick up the time code in the office and we can send the audio out on site and yeah so we started sort of we started there um and then doing um, you know, a few custom build things like some LED projects and stuff, you know, pixel strips and pixel tape kind of bits and pieces. Um, but our background has always sort of been in uh, between me and the, the, and the two business. So uh, Dom, Dom Smith, who's uh, an LD in his own right, Dom and and PJ. And PJ, you, PJ you should have on here, by the way. He's a fascinating man. Oh. Um, uh, PJ. Uh, Connect big, us. I will. Um, big in the architectural space, works at Ayrton at the moment. Um did uh the vast majority of the work on the sphere in vegas in terms oh of wow technical technical design Big. yeah um, so yeah um we sort of got together and are just sort of trying to get ev you know trying to do those those projects that are just maybe slightly out of reach of what most people want to be be doing there are there's a lot of kit out there some amazing bits of kit really really clever stuff but it's um a lot of people invest a lot of money in, in equipment and maybe don't quite know what to do with it. So uh, a big thing that we're now pushing and, you know, we went and I was down at the guys at, um, at Fuse's new shop in Lidditz the other day, yeah, doing yeah. some training with them. So doing uh, doing training on networking equipment, um, some of it quite special, some of it like very hyper-focused in on like the Luminex products, that's what they own. Yeah. Um, but also sort of going through with... Um, 
with with their crew chiefs, with their technicians that are using stuff and going, this is what we consider to be best practice, and um, this is what an IP address is and does, and um, you know, this is how we look at what different fibers look like, um, you know, and and sort of going through and trying, you know, a big thing for us is is moving into that training space, and a big part of that training space is is you know empowering people to have some knowledge about this kit yeah um you know it makes because... a lot of sense you know it makes yeah. a lot of sense and i mean as again one thing that i don't think is going to slow down anytime soon is is the size of both on the install side and on the the temporary rental uh side as well but the size of these shows you know like i i recently had ola melzig uh eurovision on the podcast and you know this year's ma system network whatever you want to call that monstrosity yeah. i can't remember how many consoles it was but it was a lot it was a lot yeah. of it was like 72 universes or no it was more than that uh, more i mean it was that. it yeah. was an insane I mean, I, you know i do i do a lot of work with um a lot of work with tim routledge and, and tom young yeah and, and alex parcel who, who did the, the one in the uk and yeah you know i didn't i didn't i was out looking after helena fisher but even that even helena's 156 universes yeah. Plus whatever I'm merging in from D3 to control all the spiders and everything else, you know. Yeah. Go back to your early example. Remember when a big show was a hog two with an overdrive box? Yeah, exactly. On it. Exactly. Um, you know. Um, so yeah, so taking care of taking care of a bit of that, you know, because everything is now becoming converged in a very different way to in a very different way to how I think the industry saw it going about. 10 years ago where it was that whole lighting video convergence thing that sort of went oh okay yeah this is a really good idea no 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 maybe not yeah um and there is yeah. still an element of that but but you know networking is tying so much more stuff together um we as an industry are pushing we're pushing some stuff but also we're not doing anything that isn't stuff we could do in the late 90s early 2000s yeah um, yeah you know um some of just the changes of course it does. quickly one second david i yeah. i just wanted to go back to this because i just googled it while we were talking oh yeah uh, the so this year's Univision was two hundred thousand parameters of control across six hundred eighty two DMX universes of output, six hundred and sixty three universes of Artnet input from the disguise video servers, running on fourteen MA three full consoles, five main lighting show programmers all working in one session. La la la. I mean it's just yeah. an insane rig. So it is. yeah. Um but yeah. it's also that, that thing of um Try. There are there are people out there who are hesitant to sort of engage with networking, and yeah. you start to read off stuff like that, and you go, "This isn't going away." No, get no. on board. Um, yeah, so I think it's brilliant. I I think it's what you're doing. You know, which I don't even know that much about yet, and I want to know a lot more. <laughs> but I think what you're doing, even just from a networking standpoint, like to provide sort of that high level of network, uh, you know, expertise when somebody is engaging in a larger, like the sphere is another great example. You know, mm. when there's a lot of new stuff going on, it's bigger, there's more components, there's more things connecting to each other. Let's bring these people in as experts. You that's, know? The, that's the idea. Um, yeah, it's it's to sort of get everybody, you know. My my big thing is, you know, I I think we should all be constantly pushing stuff forward, right? So yeah, so yeah, my 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 big thing, and what what came out of a lot of conversations with with a lot of companies in the UK and and a certain amount over here, um, was was the training thing. You know, the, these companies yeah. own the kit. Um, you know, we've got we've got an amount of rental stock, but nothing, you know, nothing really huge. Um, you know, it's not a it's not a space where we're planning to sort of we're not suddenly going to be like oh we've got sixty MPUs and four hundred Luminex Giga cores and whatever we we're not we're not that. Yeah. Um, but if you've got if you've got kit and skills and people and and you want to make all this stuff work and you want to be consistent and that sort of thing. That's where we're, we're trying to work is, is a, is a combination of yeah doing this training and delivery stuff. And we're trying to expand our, our training options. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, you know, it started off essentially we, we do a, we do like a one day ethernet for roadies course that is, um, completely agnostic to equipment for the most part. Um, like there's a bit of, um, 
in that one is a little bit of this is how you make data come out of an MA2. These are all the things you need to look at. Same for an MA3. Um, I would like to move that on to being an Ethernet for theatre technicians, a very similar thing, but with the EOS platform. I uh-huh. need to go away and learn the EOS platform because I don't know it. Right. Um, you know, that sort of thing. And then, yeah, Fuse, we did a two-day thing that went a lot more in detail into the, like, the Luminex kit and how Ariano functions and, um, and again, some more of that best practice stuff. But but the, the one-day thing is very much, it's it's not there to make everybody a systems technician overnight. Yeah. It's there to get everybody comfortable with Ethernet in, or at least start to go down that road to get them comfortable with it in the same way that people are comfortable with five pin data. It's an immersive orientation. <laughs> it's Ish. an immersive orientation. I detest yeah. the word immersive. It's really, yeah, but, but yes. Um, yeah, you detest the it, word that. immersive. I just, because everybody uses it. Yeah. And it's yeah. 80% of the time, absolutely not true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Somebody told me once, any, anybody who puts professional in their name usually isn't. Anyone who puts international in their Why name is usually one? isn't. Uh oh. Sorry. Lost my, no, my computer just had a moment. Uh oh. Uh, no, that's all right. Yeah. So uh, beyond the the training thing, you're oh, so renting the out. Thing. Yeah, you're um, renting consoles li- and gear. A little, little bit of rental um, and a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, is a bad word, consultancy. But, yeah. um, you know, we've got a couple of projects on at the moment. We're doing um, some sort of arch- architectment exterior architectural um how do we control this thing oh okay yeah you do x y and z um we're working a show at the minute that's um we are just going in to do the networking on a show like a big um uh i can't say too much about it for yeah you know various reasons but essentially big show everything's talking to everything else we are just going into essentially the network administration oh wow um, that makes a lot of sense, though. Yeah, because we're looking at 40-plus switches, and automation needs to talk to D3, needs to talk to lighting, needs to talk to audio, yeah, yeah all of that stuff um, on a scale. And it's something that is, there it is, thank you very much, and everyone walks away, and it's run by the show stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. so starting to do that kind of level of thing where we can go and we can do the design, the planning, the um, consulting on what, what systems do you needs uh what gear do you need um that side of things too so so yeah it's a bit of a it's also a bit of a you know we're quite uh we've only sort of been operational about three years and we've really the last 18 months has been sort of pushing pushing that and pushing that agenda so we're you know still a little bit of a little bit of we can be a number of things to a number of people and we're still trying to kind of find our place in the world because it's a tricky thing right because trying to because charging for to turn up and go, here is a load of knowledge, and it's not a tangible, a tangible thing in the same way that renting out kit is 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 yeah. a very interesting space to be in. Well, you know what it's worth. You know, once something's failed, you know, and, oh, and yeah. you'd pay anything for it. But going into a project, it's hard to justify. Somebody comes in and says, "Yeah, for forty thousand quid, we'll we'll come in and have experts here making sure that the network." Uh, is put together effectively, and yeah, uh, and, and, and you know, and, and they see no, that as an um, a, a, an unnecessary expense at that moment, perhaps. Or no, could. absolutely. Uh, and I think you know, we're you know, we're we've all been around long enough to understand that you know, it's not going to be. I'm not going to have a person on every show that goes. Out. Yeah, like that's not a thing. Um, but we would like to be moving into the space where we're sort of managing those those bigger things, those weird. Those weird things, you just go, I know that someone needs to deal with this, yeah. but no one is willing to deal with this, which yes. I think is is something that we have. Certainly, I've found on big tours is that, yeah, yeah. There's, there's an amount of integration that then just falls back on either the lighting network guy, if you've got one, yeah. or everybody has to have a bit of a fight about it and make it work somehow. Um, and I think another thing about it is, is, you know, like I say, these companies have brought this kit and... A lot of the time, you know, a lot of the time might be a bit, um, a bit overzealous. But you know, kit will be specified by maybe the LD, and mm-hmm. they are not necessarily the best person to be in that position to be making those decisions. Yeah, you know, oh, I have to have all my MPs in front of the house. Okay, yeah. why? But now we have to run the snake in order to flash the rig out, and da, da, da. or it has to all come out of MA nodes. Okay, cool. But then that's 
that's a lot of money that then gets out at the end of a life cycle. So why yeah. don't we go agnostic to that and then it can be used on the show and yeah. or um okay, cool. We've we we own an amount of I don't know, passport things. Okay, cool. How what's what's our best way you could go about deploying that? Yeah. You know, how do we look at building standardization? And you know, that's that's something we'd we we're sort of keen to work with with companies to go, okay, cool. How do we how do we help move standardization of how we do this as an industry forward? You know, whether that's training and whether those levels of training, but also the the how do we put a rack together? How do we do IP schemes? How do we do um you know, how do we start doing all of that configuration? How do we make sure it's re you know, we try and get it consistent across a company so that when you know, when there is a problem on I don't know, when there's a problem on ELO, the control department can go, Oh, okay, well, this is this is how the scheme is always laid out. Yeah. These are all the IP addresses. So can you just check that this, 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 this is correct? Oh, it's that. That I don't know. That subnet mask wrong. Okay, cool. Update that, and it will be fine because yeah, we're we're standardizing this stuff. Um, well, I I had a gentleman on the podcast. Uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago, probably now, who um did audio, uh, wireless audio for like events the size of Super Bowl, uh, and. You know, it it started out because every different department was using different headsets or using different whatever, and it, it was just mayhem. Absolutely. And yeah. so what they did is they initially came in and just made sure that everything worked with everything else, and then they just started packaging the whole thing and saying, here, you know, we need wireless for this department, this department, this department, this department, and they just put the whole package together and made sure that everything worked and there was no, you know, wireless, whatever you call it, interference, crosstalk, yeah. whatever. And, um, you know, very specialized, like you said. Yeah, um, you know, and, and going going back to our earlier conversation, you know, all those departments here are getting some response specialists. Yeah, and, and yeah. yeah, we're just sort of trying to grab this particular bit by the horns. Yeah, do you yeah. do you need some programming done? Absolutely, we can survive with the program. Mm -hmm. Do you need something yeah. to tour? We can absolutely get something to tour. Well, but for the most part, it's you know, it, it's the you know, we, we what we don't want to be doing is we don't not sorry, don't want to be doing. We're quite happy to do whatever, but. Um, it's the the things that companies will comfortably take under the wing and deal with. Yeah, great. When it starts to get tricky, when you start to go, we need to do this thing. It's a bit weird. Yeah. Or we need to do wireless over five hundred meters, but it needs to be full data. Can you come and have a chat with us? Or yeah, let some kids do. You know that that sort of those specialist areas and that um, that knowledge that we've got to to be able to go and deploy that and and have confidence in what we're doing to make sure that's correct. Yeah. That, yeah, there might there potentially is a cheaper way of doing it, maybe. Um, but then actually having the skill set and the knowledge to do that deployment is yeah. is a very different thing. Well, then the other thing is like all the peripheral stuff. You know, like I I know Act over here in North America distributes a product, and I can't remember what it's called, but it is um, it allows you to remote into uh, oh, uh, the bridge. Yeah, the bridge. Yeah, and so even just understanding that product and how it works with the the network and the system and everything else and being able to make sure that they're using that effectively or properly you know i mean it, it reminds me any technology especially new technology requires a company like what you're talking about to sort of know everything all the nuances all how to put that whole thing together as opposed to, you know, well, there's a cool component or there's a, and it reminds me of AI. I talk about AI a lot on this podcast. You, you do talk about AI a lot. Uh, but, you know, the <laughs> thing about AI, I love it, first of all. Yeah. I really do. And I think, obviously, we're not going to stop the bus. So you might as well figure out, uh, it's you know, not going away. Yeah, how not yeah. to get run over by it. And, <laughs> but, but the cool thing about AI as an opportunity for especially those young kids right now, you know, is just, being able to go to companies and and help them understand how to best incorporate AI, how to engage it into your business. What are the areas of your business? And I talk to these experts with my business. I talk to them all the time. You know, okay, what do you what do you think you should employ AI on in our business? And they'll look at how our business flows and they'll say, I think logistics is a good area. Maybe here is a good area and here's a good area. That's where you should be investing money. And then they'll come to me with some ideas and prices. You know, up for $75,000, we'll build you this cool widget that does this thing, right? 
And so I look at yours similarly. I mean, you're just, you're taking yeah. a niche area of an entire show and, and it's an area that, again, if it goes wrong, is very expensive. Uh, and if it goes right, it's a beautiful thing. And you're just making sure it goes right. You yeah. know, it's pretty yeah. straightforward. You know, and that integration of stuff, you know, if you start to look at even, um, even if you start to look at like big Broadway style musicals and that sort of thing where, where everybody's in a really tight space and, and mm -hmm. all that sort of thing, actually to, to be able to go, well, actually, why don't we run, why don't we run, four bits of fiber and everyone can just be on that and have a system and have poe here and that can do speakers or you could have a yeah you could just put a camera there do you need a camera yeah. there we'll just put a camera there yeah um you know and, and actually opening up that thing to how some of this technology and, and and what what is currently available to us um that we are maybe maybe also less you know a lot and some people just don't realize this stuff's out there and actually the the integration of that isn't um uh isn't hugely expensive and isn't it, it's hugely beneficial to to show yeah yeah you know, no, being able sense. to put cameras everywhere do you do your recording do your um you know just being able to send midi and time code over ip to the lighting to com to department because it's just easier than i find it hilarious on on elr i've got a 150 foot two quad fibers that go front to back that can do you know capable of doing 10 gigabit a second i've also got three bits of three pin cable lashed to it to do comms and time code huh. um, interesting yeah you know so just sort of trying to go well actually we, we can we can make this more um more efficient certainly yeah you know and, and especially when you're starting to do those installs and things like that yeah you know being yeah able to, to converge everything is is really interesting and it, and cheaper because suddenly if you've if I've got one switch, if I say I've got two switches front of house for lighting, I've got two switches at stage right dimmers, I've got two at stage left dimmers, and then the audio department have got the same, and the automation department have probably got half a dozen. Well, actually, that could be six, couldn't it? That could just yeah. be that could just be six whatevers and yeah, clever. Yeah, why do we have or to be smaller separate. ones? Or yeah, yeah, it could just you know integrate into that. So yeah, um, yeah, it's interesting. It, it, it's, so. Uh, how are, how are just you trying, just trying a little bit of trying to find our place in the world a bit i think as well i get it yeah, yeah. well new things are always a little tough to to you know find your ground and and carve out a niche carve out a space you know why why do i need you this is the way we've yeah. always done it for 72 years in our business yeah. you know um how are you finding the balance between running that business and running your road business you know being out on um, on tour at the moment, it's uh, <laughs> at the moment it's a comedy goldmine because uh, yeah. like this morning, I'm, this right before we get we're on this, I'm trying to uh, trying to be on a Zoom meeting with everybody back in the UK, me and the project lead uh, out in like Hong Kong. So yeah, um, <laughs> just trying to line all of that up on a daily basis yeah. is, is hard. Um, I think that um, I mean the other you know the. It's sort of okay when I'm a bit more at home, but it's it is difficult. But the other thing is, it's I, I you know I I've toured this band for a long time. I really like touring this band. I really like being on tour. Yeah. Um, so I've got no real plans on on living in a Stopping. world where I don't yeah. occasionally take a tour out. Yeah. Um, uh, had we known we were going to be this busy right now, maybe the answer would have been not to take the tour. But yeah. Um, yeah, getting getting the balance, but I've got uh, a couple of really, really, really good business partners. Um, uh, we've got some freelancers we work really closely with who are exceptional. Um, so you sort of getting that, getting that right and getting that balance right. And it's all you know. Ultimately, we we started a company for a number of reasons, and and a big one was to um, basically just have an excuse to hang out with some people we quite like and do some cool stuff. That's cool. So we we just keep doing that. Does anyone oh, work full time doing, in that business, or is it all just kind of get uh, together as needed? At the moment, it's all it's all a bit get together as we need yeah. it. But it's it's looking a lot more like I will probably go full time. Yeah, sooner rather than later. Yeah. Um, but again, well, that's it a good thing. Depends on. It's a good thing, and also you know, like I could go full time, and I could do you know, I could just do a tour road stuff through yep. through that company, and you know, it doesn't. Yeah. Really, um, you know, function make it that much of a difference. Um, yeah. 
Well, so, there's yeah, so many it's... there's so many collectives out there that that do their own thing and this thing, you know, and yeah. and there's no conflict and nobody gets upset as long as you go into it knowing that that's how it's going to work and uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, I don't think that's a big problem. Yeah, because you know, like the, uh, PJ, you know, PJ has a uh, his his coat buttons up tightly over a number of other duties, and yeah. um, uh, you know, Dom's uh, you know along with with like Johnny Barker's running Neon Black and. Uh, you know, as a design collective, so um, yeah, and 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 the other thing as well is that all sort of feeds each other as well. You know, if they get an architectural project, then we can go, oh, okay, cool. Well, what are we doing about control for that? Yeah. So there's there's an element of that, and and but yeah, having having a team around you, you sort of trust to just go, can you can you deal with X, Y, and Z, and we're knowing knowing enough of the same people, that Venn diagram of who do you know that does this, who do you know that does this, just mm. allows that yeah. to be really kind of easy and straightforward. Um, yeah, that makes sense. But yeah, so not not quite full time, but yeah, it's um uh fingers crossed. What I mean, are I would wh- like I would like an excuse to spend a bit more time at home with my dog. So Yeah, I get it. With your dog. What about your mm. you have a significant oh, other? I'm other half, obviously, but yeah. yes. um, <laughs> and my new you might not want to forget about yeah. them. No, it's true. I will I will get yeah. in trouble for that. You said um, he wanted to spend more time with your dog. It's true. Okay, perfect. Um, you can go live in the fucking doghouse with your dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah, accurate. Yeah. Um, <laughs> perfect. Yep. More room for me in the master bedroom. Uh, sorry, it's not called master bedroom. It's called main bedroom now or whatever it's called. I forget. Master seems to have gone away. Um, where do you see technology going? Like, give, Make a couple oh, predictions on technology as it relates to our industry. Um, uh, I think I'm fairly safe in saying that until... AI learns to pull points into the air that we're all relatively safe. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Uh, where's technology going? Um, I can see there being uh, a lot more of this integration stuff, which is you know entirely self-serving. I realise, but yeah. Um, but yeah, everybody talking to everybody else is going to be a, is going to be a much bigger thing. Um, I think more and more so, we're going to be relying on networks to shift essentially everything around yeah i would um, agree with that i mean we already we're already most of the way there but i think the next few years it's just going to be well, it's all ip based because yeah. we can reduce the latency so much that it's it's not a problem um lighting wise lighting wise i think we're in an interesting part of, it, we're in an interesting place at the moment because uh slightly controversial opinion everybody's producing the same light with a slightly different gobo load in it Totally true. Totally true. Well, and they're, generally they're every new, company a... has one trick. They've got one like yep. thing that everybody's got to have. Like right now for Martin, it's the Mac One. You know, for oh, the Mac Air, great. Mac for a brilliant bit of kit. It is a very I, cool. I light. just I, I saw uh, I I saw I saw it in uh, Frankfurt a couple of years ago. Yeah. And the first thing I said to Ben was, "You're going to sell thousands of those." Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I talked to Ben a few days ago. I don't know. I didn't talk to Ben. I talked to somebody else in Martin, high up in Martin, and I won't yeah. mention his name. And uh, I think he told me that they've sold, I think he said 40,000 already or something I am no, at this point. I'm in no way surprised. Yeah. I mean, it's um, it's a large number considering it's only been out for a couple of months. Yeah. But I, but so. I think it's, it's what's cool about it is that it's, um, I think it's sort of, it's a brilliant little rock and roll gag because you can put them, you throw them around like glitter, right? But um, also, it's it's sort of the death of the park and scroller and that sort of thing. Yeah. Finally, that you know you can just tuck it away and it moves. Great, yeah. ideal. You know, well, and what is it in a... in England? Is it like twelve hundred quid or something like that? Twelve I or thirteen hundred quid? Don't know. Like in the US, yeah, it's fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's not a lot. Of, so not a lot of money. You can throw them everywhere. Lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just the right product at the right time, doing the right yeah. amount of stuff, you know, with the right yeah. intensity. Like it didn't need to be the brightest light in the rig, but it needed to be bright enough. And mm-hmm. yeah, big win, huge win. Yeah, but huge win. so yeah, um, I agree with you. Though. Think Everyone Ayrton, has Ayrton some great stuff. Ayrton yeah, some really nice products out there at the moment. Um, I had ninety of the i fortes out last year on Helena, and I think we swapped one. Yeah, in nine months. Yeah. And yeah, that's a nice light as well. Nine, if they weren't in a truck, they were on. Yeah. So like, yeah. Um, uh, you know, so there's there's a lot of. Do that. you use so them for follow spots as well? Yeah. Yeah. Not on not on ELO, which is great. It's the best yeah. 
one of the best things about this job. No, no follow spots. Oh, really? None. Yeah, we we, we did it the first tour. So, um, so Tim Routledge just the light designer on it. Um, has been since sort of the the whole comeback thing in what 2015, 16. Yeah. Um, uh, and then we had we had the lovely Matt Pittman come and light the first sort of tour while Tim was doing Beyonce. We had three follow spots, and they basically locked them off. And every time Jeff took a step away from the microphone, they faded off because huh. that's what they wanted. So we just stopped carrying follow spots. Yeah, what for? Yeah, yeah. Um, just key lighting. Yeah, uh, the i the i forties for follow spots are great. Um, uh, yeah, really good, really consistent. Yeah, like, just yeah, really nice. Um, yeah. Have you seen this macula thing? Macula. So there's essentially it's a um it's european based i can't quite remember where but it's uh it's a slightly different version of a robo swap system it's still the sort of handlebars and camera but it has a little bit more of the tying in of multiple units that you can do in the way that you can do on follow me rather okay. than rather than the way that you can do on um robospot Interesting. Which is quite cool. Uh, they just Macula, put it on... like M A C U L A. I think so. Yeah, I'd have to look it up. Huh. Um, yeah, but I'll they just, have to I know they just put it on. Uh, they just put it on Hamilton uh, in the UK for their for their touring rig. And um, uh, yeah, I had, a, I had a very brief chat with the LT of the week, and they're very happy with it. And um, but yeah, I think that's interesting uh, because it's completely fixture agnostic. I think that's quite interesting. Ah, yeah. So that's suddenly you're one. not tied to it being. Um, you know, a Best Boy or a uh, or an I Forte or a BMFL. Um, yeah, how how they will deal with it in if it ever comes to the US, I don't know. But um, yeah, I'm looking at it right cool. now. I I wonder if they have distribution in the US yet. Uh, I don't know yeah. anything about this one for some reason. Yeah, um, um, it, it looks might, interesting. It may well, I I don't know what the I don't know what the technicalities of bringing that over and the obviously because there's patents and all sorts of stuff. So I don't, yeah. I don't know, but it's it's quite a cool thing. I think that's um, worth keeping an eye on, um, especially because yeah, suddenly you're you're able to use any fixture you like. It's interesting because they have distribution sort of all over the world except in North America, yeah, which doesn't make much sense. Like it's got to be the biggest market for it. Uh, I would absolutely. think. Yeah, no, um, I'll have to look into that. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, but that's cool. Uh, I think the tracking stuff's only going to get cleverer, um, and I think I think AI is most probably going to have, um, you know, in, in terms of what we will things we will see directly, uh, uh, like responses to AI. I think you know, you know, the, the the big one of people using it to sort of generate looks and content and and stuff that that no one else has got. I think is is legitimate i think that's quite good but i think where we'll really see it start to shine is things like um uh learning those habits you know doing being able to go here is the follow spot here's the tracking okay cool taking all of that data and learning it so it's Mm. able to react in a in a maybe a slightly better way or a slightly softer way or um that side of things so you know repeating repeating and, and taking that data set and doing I, don't, I assume some sort of witchcraft, sage burning, I don't know. But yeah. whatever it does in order to make that whole process a little bit more, I understand how human beings move a bit more and, and that sort of thing. Hmm. Um, that's that's an interesting thought that I hadn't had as far as at least early stage stuff. Like I keep thinking, you know, tedious lines of JavaScript and stuff, you know, like just oh, I mean, all, all the that. really yeah, boring coding stuff that you have to do when you're a, a lighting director uh, yeah. or a programmer. Um or, you know, assigning fixtures or whatever it is, like just the tedious work uh, I would have thought would be at least the first intro in so that because I think on the console, on the control side, they're very afraid to approach this AI thing because designers are just going to say boycott, you know, ABC console company because they're putting AI into their control systems. Um and then, you know, on the other side, you know, obviously designers and directors and programmers don't want to lose that creative control over the show or whatever by yeah. sticking AI in and saying, what do you think? You know, and uh, suddenly rendering themselves useless. Well, I mean, the, the, that's the that's the thing. All of it, though, is that you could go, what do you think? But it can only, AI can and does only function based on 
things it has previously seen or worked with. Right. It can't, yeah. It you know it it's a it's a very interesting thing that I think that creatives are um, or that people who associate sort of creatives being a little bit scared by it, understandably in many ways, but it's also not going to. It, it can never be truly creative. Because it because we'll it can only it can only work based off of you know, what people have done before. Now that's not to say that some of the the best talents in the lighting industry that we know from a design point of view don't do, do a exactly very similar the same. thing. Yeah, um, yeah. But well, yeah, I think I in think a sense, isn't a it the bit same of though? Taken out of it. But isn't yeah. it the same? Like, aren't isn't everything we do creatively? A combination of our past experiences, I other mean, things yes. that we've done, things we've seen, things we've heard, you know, whatever it is, what's going on in the news right now. I mean, just all sorts of outside senses coming in at us. Mm. Um, I don't know. I just I feel like I feel like our industry, you know, is is really waiting for AI to come in and, and grab a hold. Yeah. And I think we got to just decide where it's going to grab a hold and, and where it can benefit us the most. Yeah. Uh, because I think the jobs that it's going to replace probably needed to be replaced. The jobs that are most creative won't be replaced, I don't believe. And so, you know, to me, like that's going to be parts of jobs. That's going to be like lines of tedious code uh, yeah. is the I mean, earliest. If you, if, you know, we look at, we look at our... Um... It's the best way to put it. If we look at our lighting, like equipment trumpet, that's constantly sort of doing this. Yeah. Um, we we are going to reach a point. If you if you look at the last twenty years from where we you know even what coming off the back of like arts and consoles and hog two right twenty years ago probably to where we are now in terms of of what we're controlling. If if that continues the rate it goes, then you're going to become really stuck in terms of you're going to have to adopt AI and AI is going to have to look after certain parts of these processes in order for just to be able to control that level of stuff we're trying to do. Yeah. Well, here's the other thing, David. I mean, that's exactly right. But here's the other thing is everyone's assuming the AI, the, uh, AI is going to be in the console, but I actually believe that AI is going to be in the lights. I, I think lights are going to become smart. And um, therefore, maybe less information needs to come from the console and the light is going to do some of the decision making or self-diagnosis or whatever it is. You know, like I just I think a lot of this is going to happen at the at the level of the the light, the speaker cabinet, the sort of end point, uh, mm -hmm. not at the not at the front end of it. Yeah. Um, I could be wrong. I've been wrong. 85 percent of the time so uh who knows there's a good chance it's gonna happen yeah. again yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah um yeah um i mean what, what else is sort of coming down the pipeline um there is do you know richard cadena uh yes i guess was do. it richard who said i want i want to see light bend you know oh yeah i want them to figure out how to bend light yeah you just know? get it around just get it around that corner yeah. yeah, if you can bend light, <laughs> then I'm impressed. You know. Yes, so. I think I think uh, I I um, I'm led to believe it's Richard's fault that I'm on this podcast. So, uh, oh, is it? Yeah, uh, um, yeah. I love Richard. Richard's a great guy. Oh, he's great. We um, we uh, we got introduced many years ago by of the the late great Craig Burrows, and ah. um, yeah, and uh, we've sort of just every time we'll we'll every time we're in the same city we'll try and catch up and have lunch oh, that's so cool. want, it t tries to be about once a year and it's delightful yeah I've got, yeah, yeah a lot of time for Richard. well and yeah. and i was actually when you were talking about education i was going to say have you ever met richard cadena yeah. you should connect with him because he's actually getting quite good at it you know yeah yeah so, yeah. Yeah. yeah finally yeah um, <laughs> yeah it's taken um, him a while yeah no I, i've yeah, a lot of time for Richard. We're enormously talented. Likewise, there, was, there were some great people out there. I mean, you know, uh, like um, the guys at Lamp and Pencil in the UK, uh, Robin Barton, particularly, really, really good. He does, you know, steering committee for like the BS seven nine oh nine, which is uh, the electrical code that deals with um, oh. uh, like temporary installation stuff. It, it's, oh, okay. Uh, it's if the nearest analogy would be like the ETCP electricians yeah. over here. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a couple more guys on that whole thing that that are really good. Um, there's Chris West of West Training, who's 
uh, who's taught lighting uh, consoles and various bits and pieces for a long time. Um, does amazing work. Um, yeah, there's a there's a few there's a few people out there doing some amazing training stuff. I like um, that. Yeah, I like that because again, like we talked about right at the very front end of this thing, you know, it lacks. You know, so that's why mm. I think people go through normal school and yeah. uh and they end up in technical theater and yeah. um, i'm not saying that's a waste still... of time <laughs> you no, know, not at all, but i think we're that. still overcorrecting from it's certainly what i think what we are um finding in the uk uh certainly my my take on it um there are a lot of people going to drama school there are a lot of people uh being trained to be designers or associates and there are a lot of people doing more technical based courses that are very geared towards programming um mm -hmm. and that's great but i think the the understanding that everyone needs to have is that for you on a show you probably have what 0 0.25 to 0 0.5 of a lighting designer yeah you've probably got the same ratio for a programmer and yeah. then you've got like what four or five lighting technicians yeah. so i think there is a a certain amount of re-correction that needs to happen that is yes absolutely we should be training people to be created to be programmers to, because there are some amazing people who have come out of that and and done that you know you look yeah. at people like tom young you look at chris hurst um look at morgan Evans. um amazing but they are a very select few people in what is quite a wide um uh intake out output yeah, of, of university agreed. students yeah. and uh what i think um we're finding and it is i need someone i can hand a plan to and go can you hang that truss and plug it up yes and to go back yeah, and that it's, is challenging it's hung unplugged up yeah well and um, a lot of those technicians uh, technicians and I think stagehands were sort of the first people that left our industry when COVID happened. And, you know, because they were like, Hey, you know what, to hell with it. I can stay home and, and work for Amazon and get yeah. paid the same or more money. And I don't have yeah. to go on the road and I can be with my girlfriend and my dog and whatever. Yeah. And, uh, no, absolutely. You know, I've, I've got friends I who get it. exactly that. They literally, they yeah. went to work for Amazon. I mean, my, uh, the, the lovely Mike Blondell was currently Adler. Um, yeah, he literally went to work for Amazon, learned to drive a truck because they went, we need truck drivers. Um, and he came at the other end of it. And, you know, having seen his two kids grow up um, for a few years, came at the other end of it and, and went, oh, I'm going to go and work full time for a company in town because yeah. they're not leaving the industry, but he's not on the road anymore. He was doing yeah. a very similar job to me, you know, front of house systems teching or whatever. Um, you know, he's like, oh, no, I'll go home every night. It's nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it is a tricky thing, but I think there is a, there is almost a, I feel like there's almost a duty of care within within like the the systems that we have at the moment to go uh a, a bit of a cliche but learn the trade Le learn a trade part of it be a designer absolutely all day long I, it's really important it's amazing work yeah um but go and go and learn how to solder led tape go and learn how to hang lights learn yeah. how to be sociable learn how to run crew because that is what that is what is going to pay your rent is what's going to get you your mortgage that is what's going to set you up in 10 years time when you've yeah. gathered a whole load of information and contacts and people to then go actually i'm going to go and i'm going to go and step i'm going to step into that design space i'm going yeah. to go and put my name out there and i think i think that's really important because i think at the moment we are um struggling with um, the fact that we're not, we don't have a variety of voices um, uh, producing work necessarily because so many people are from a, you know, a white middle class background because they're the ones who have got the support structure in place to be able it's to true. go and yeah. be a suffering artist. For so your and that's... your training, how like is it structured to where you've got a calendar and here's our different training dates and here's um, what we're moment, training on uh, those dates? At the moment, no. Um, we're very much sort of working. Uh, we're looking to work with companies directly to book in trainings with them. Um, I see. The idea of that being that one. Honestly, don't know what my calendar is next year yet. I yeah. hopefully have some UK dates put in January, February that will do some open call stuff. Yeah. Um, but what we would love to be working with is companies directly, so that we can also do a bit of, um, uh, we can do a bit of work and go. Actually, what what do you specifically need to be training on? Yeah. You know, what kit do you own already? What are you looking to get? Um, yeah. And we can kind of work around that. Um, also makes it very easy for us to be to be able to go. Okay, cool. Everyone gets. You know, if they've got 
all the gear and all the stuff there we can turn up do the training fine if we're having to get if we're having to bring our kit with us that's another expense it's all that stuff. so it's at the moment we're trying to work and work with companies sort of directly to to book in trainings no that makes sense um, that makes sense to to make it a little bit more yeah a little bit more uh bespoke to them yeah well, I mean, that's that's obviously beneficial to the company. If I own, you know, Joey's Lighting Company and I'm doing this specialty training inside my facility, I think that's providing a service to the community, to the region. You know, I'm saying, hey, look, we want people to learn how to do this stuff. And obviously people coming out of that, I can watch them closely and say, hey, John was actually really cool. And Bob over there and, and Tammy over there, they were really cool people. I want to try and get them in and hire them. And yeah, exactly. So, and, you know, the one, the one we just did with Fuse was, was all people that they employ regularly. Yeah. Um, and it's yeah, it's, oh, it's, it's it's getting that sort of getting me to go. Oh, okay, cool. But I think the what the interesting thing is that you get at university and you get those sorts of things that you just don't get to do, for the most part, is actually having the time to go go through all this stuff, go back over the basics, go through layer one. How is a piece of Cat Five game built? Yeah, and why? Or how is this fiber done? Go through the switches, go through the bits and pieces, and with a little bit more time, like doing our two day one. Um, there is a, a large portion of the day is basically play around with some stuff. We'll go over some things, but play around with this kit because the I would say suggest to you the vast majority of people do not get an opportunity to get hands on with this kit with somebody who knows what's going on with it yeah. outside of the um, the three a.m. that trust doesn't work sitting behind a rack shouting expletives at it and crying. That makes sense. Yeah, and that is not. Yeah, I get it. That's not what we call a an environment for education. Yeah. Um, so, so actually, being able to put people in a room, surround them with other people who are learning the same process, so everyone's learning together. They've got somebody they can go. Actually, how do you do this? How it's do immersive you do this in real life. It's. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm just being a dick. Don't make now. me come up there. Um, and but giving people the opportunity to to play around with the kit, get some knowledge about it, get some understanding yeah. of it before they're in a situation where they're suddenly they're having to learn it and under an enormous amount of pressure. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, and again, then when it breaks, you know, then you're in real trouble. Then you're like in a panic, yeah. and you know, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So when, and, and, when... and like I say, coming into working with those companies, developing those relationships to allow us to go okay cool well if you've got project x y or z that's a bit more complicated give us a call we'll come in yeah, and chat about yeah. It. Well, we've got people whatever um but and, and yeah being able to go well okay we we can tailor this to this we can do that or, or you a big campus house okay well we can we can build a we can build our third section around how do we get the stuff out of campus or ava yeah you yeah know, all that sort of thing or um, you know we did we covered um uh we covered a little bit of um like the networking side of robospot for example for fuse so to yeah. going through right this is this is what we consider best practice for setting up your systems for robo spots and then um they've recently changed the software so you can now do all of your networking at the network ports you'd have to do five pin conversion all this. yeah so going actually well this is how this is how we approach it this is how we used to approach it and how those systems are still set to do this is how the new system is in theory supposed to work because i've not used it yet and um you know I, i'm trying very hard to be as accurate as i can with something that i've used which is no kidding, yeah. scary yeah. um so um but yeah, you know this is this is this this is what's similar this is what's different yeah yeah so just be you know being able to go okay cool what 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 do you need what what have you got what are you using yeah yeah that's cool and then you just basically put together a custom program yeah yeah, yeah. we've got like i said we've got this sort of the one day thing we call ethernet for roadies which is sort of yeah. very much an off the shelf and we're, we're doing that and then but yeah everything else yeah we're we're, we're really up for working with people to do, to do yeah. custom stuff and that because the sense. whole thing's a journey right like you know i've done i've done a couple i've taken notes i've changed stuff it will happen again and again you know because this stuff is the stuff is changing, like like the RoboSpot thing, you know. Like, yeah. Oh, there's new software for this, or there's new versions of there's new versions of stuff in Luminex, or yeah. product X has Makes come to the end of life. Okay, cool. Yeah. Or you know. Um, so when do you get to go home to uh, your uh, your significant other and possibly your other, dog as well? And uh, possibly dog. Um, the I think I fly home the twenty seventh of October. Okay, and you're home yeah. for a little while, or yeah, I'm for a little bit. Um, 
I might have a couple of little trips. I've not booked anything in next year yet. Yeah. I've been asked for a couple of things, but um, uh, there is a bit of me that's trying to go actually put my best foot forward to show Binary for a bit and see what happens. Um, so so yeah, is, we will, is your partner we will in, in the business as well? Yeah, she's a, uh, she's a production electrician for theatre shows. Oh, cool. So, but, yeah, so she's, she's local. She doesn't travel. Or oh, she I does mean, travel. Yeah, I mean, we, 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 live in, we live in the Midlands of the UK, so we're, we're yeah. about a couple of hours out of London, so there's a fair amount of toing and froing from London. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, we have the carbon footprint of a charcoal Sasquatch. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> That's funny. Is, yeah, um, uh, so yeah, sort of in and out of town, and then depending on where we're prepping, and we sort of we lucked out. We moved, we moved there, and 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 everyone else seems to have moved to us. So we're about thirty five, forty minutes away from PRG in Longbridge, and we're about an hour away from Christie, and about an hour away from Solartech. So, um, or about, nice. yeah, which is not too bad. So if we're ever prepping stuff in any of those warehouses, it's great because we just go home for an evening. That's perfect. Um, That's perfect. Uh, but yeah, she's so yeah, she's on the trade. So we sort of yeah, the start of this year, I had six months off, and she went off and did about five West End shows. Oh, um, nice. So who yeah. takes care of the dog when you're both gone? Oh, uh, we have uh, an amazing pair of dog sitters who are. Ah, um, nice. He's, he's been going there since he was a, a puppy and he gets what kind of dog is one he? of the row. He's a Parsons Russell Terrier. So he's like I a, have no like idea a, what that looks like. Uh, he's like a Jack Russell with big legs. Ah. Yeah. Um, okay. He's got a little bit of Australian Shepherd in him. So he's also really, really clever. So keeping him, keeping occupied is, is key. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, fun. He's, uh, yeah. Amazing. Austin. Yeah fun yeah cool well i appreciate you taking the time to do this it sounds oh, like you've had a busy Thank morning so yeah oh i've had a little bit of a busy morning but i now have uh i now have an afternoon and a day off tomorrow so ah, nice i will be visiting the sign museum apparently and i imagine that there'll be like i say some bar somewhere with beer and chicken wings so perfect i'll be quite content you're not getting um, up to western canada are you uh no we just we did a we did our one show in vancouver and then we did toronto a couple of nights ago but that's that's it I'm oh afraid. okay yeah well i won't see it because i love it up there it's really delightful. yeah yeah it's yeah. nice it's a nice time of year too i mean it's a little cold oh, yeah. today but it's been it's been beautiful you i know, am it's been... fine with it yeah yeah you like cold yeah. I, I like the I do well, I don't really like the heat. I think is more the thing yeah um, yeah you know i'm i'm very much still this blonde and ginger so I, yeah I, I have to put um factor 50 on to open the fridge more than go outside well, so um, england it's... england is a good place to be when you are allergic to sunlight that's for sure it, it is yeah but then the yeah. Problem is like, if i'm there then people go oh come on come and do a european tour and then you're in italy and it's 40 yeah. degrees and i'm just yeah. going no no, no absolutely not <laughs> that's funny yeah, yeah my my son raced in england all last year he lived there and um i just remember getting the calls from him like dead <laughs> <laughs> like you dead. you don't understand okay. what it's like yeah. to start a race on dry then it's wet then it's a little bit wet then it's dry then the sun comes out then it's pouring rain and you know yeah, yeah he's yeah. like it's unbelievable <laughs> like you i don't try, know what try, to dress you try for doing festivals in it yeah that's yeah. true too huh that's festivals true too. before we had ip rated fixtures that was uh, yeah that's oh my um, god with all those was, uh yeah. all those uh inflated oh things light yeah. fixture condoms yeah. yeah awful awful i did a many years ago i did a show on the south bank in the middle of february the south bank of the thames yeah middle of february with like 70 odd sharpies and there was me i can't remember who's crew chiefing it and then the the lovely Pradary baskerville who, who's uh roger walters ld no oh, i'm looking know. after it and and yeah we were just putting these things out of the south bank at the condoms are flying off and the, <laughs> the tent they'd sent us to put the dimmers in we literally went away for 15 minutes to go a bite to eat came back and the tent sort of just broken into tiny yeah. pieces um yeah it's like oh we're gonna go yeah. about that we're going to get a run up we're going to get a van we're going to put the dimmers in the van yeah, oh <laughs> my goodness what yeah, a no, mess uh, yeah england england weather is yeah variable yeah variable at best um, yeah no my kid and you know he's a knucklehead from south florida and so he's like the only kid over there in, you know, end of October or early November in shorts. Like he's got shorts and a T-shirt on and, you know, no socks and flip flops or whatever. And yeah. people are like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. There's it's something him, wrong him with you. Him and roadies. Just yeah. The shorts yeah. department. Yeah. yeah it's uh, crazy. It's crazy. Very good. Yeah. All right, my um, friend. Well, uh, well thank you so again, much. thank you. Um, yeah, I will yeah, it's been hopefully interesting. catch up with your LDI, question mark. 
Yeah, I'll be at LDI. We're doing something fun at LDI that uh, we're going to announce in the next couple of weeks. But Geezers of Gear presents blank. And it. uh, it'll be a blast. It's going to be fun. Fantastic so. stuff. Well, I look forward to it. Um, yeah. Right. Well, look, thank you so much for having me on. And you. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you.